Okay, we'll come back to our regular meeting, uh, reconvene the public session, get the city attorney to give us reported actions on the closed session items. Yes, the city council consider the item listed on the uh, agenda as well as adding an item of potential litigation, and there is uh, there are no announcements to be made. Okay, and with that, we'll have the Pledge of Allegiance by Mayor Pro Tem Kevin Bash, who will also do the invocation. Ready to begin? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Absolutely stoked. God give me wisdom. Act to the better every. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. Now we'll have the City Council communications, reports, reasonable, board, reason, reasonable boards, and commissions. We'll call upon Mayor Tim, Mayor Pro Tem Bice to start the council communications. PowerPoint will appear on the screen for each council member. So I don't think I, I had my WR COG, I had a whole bunch of meetings, but the WR COG, um, I'm now the, the chair, which is a lot of fun. Um, but one of the things I did want to pass on, I sent you all um, the Beaumont decision, so I won't touch on that. But one of the things that is deeply, deeply concerning is that the move to automation has been accelerated. And the service uh, industries in particular are being really impacted. Um, a lot of companies are using this time to convert away from people to machines. And it's, it's really, really accelerated. And the bad news is, is that it's not just a trend in the United States. It's a trend worldwide. And what's happening is it's a, it is downsizing the middle class. And so one of the things that uh, I don't know how we do it because it's like the CNUSD is over here and the Riverside City College District is here and the cities are here surrounding them. And what really needs to happen is people need to work on those puppies. They need to, they need to tool up to begin to find ways that they're going to, to, to work into what is going to be a new and very frightening era. There are computers that literally, you will lose 100 jobs to one computer and or one machine. And so um, I don't know how we'll do it, but I'm hoping in the next year we can find a way to team with, I mean, it's really interesting. Right now, the biggest hiring pool is out of the high schools. They're self-taught, they don't have a whole bunch of baggage with them, they don't have a bunch of preconceived notions, and they're trainable. So you got kids walking out of high school who are self-taught, and literally by the time they're 21, they're making some very good bucks because they understand how to operate, develop, and, and, and work these machines. So I'm hoping that we can, uh, I'm trying to, we're moving that way, WRCOG, but I think that the cities, Eastville, Riverside, Corona, Norco, Europa Valley, given that we actually have, we're spoiled, we have very good school systems, and people I don't think always appreciate that, and I think somehow we need to work with those in order to, 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 to make a difference. Secondly, I'm going to include, uh, that uh, you guys may know this, but the Amazingly, the Riverside City College District, Norco College, the Veterans Center, we were very worried it was going to be downsized. And I just discovered that it's going to be built exactly as it was planned. The groundbreaking is coming up, and they're going to do a film, and I'm going to be doing the voiceover, so I'm kind of going to have fun with that. But I'm very excited about that project, and we have to give credit to Sabrina Cervantes, we have to give credit to Senator Roth, Riverside City College District, and 
mainly Norco residents who really came out and said this is what they wanted. This uh, Veterans Center at Norco's College is literally one of the finest in the United States, so I'm really excited about that coming up. And that's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Let's see who's next. Councilmember Grunmeyer. Nothing to report. Nothing to report. Okay, who's next? Hoffman. Yeah, I'm down here. Um, I had a couple, I had a RICWA meeting, but that's not a report on tonight. I'll talk about the Veterans Committee update. Uh, we are going a little bit of different directions. As far as I know, this, uh, we came as a, the Veterans Committee came to this council about doing the Gold Star, Blue Star Mother uh, monument and uh, memorial up there at Ingalls Park next to the George Ingalls Memorial Plaza. So what we're going to do is we, we're going a little different direction. We have a new design that we'll be bringing back to you once we go and talk to the Gold and Blue Star Mothers uh, for their approval. And then we're going to bring it back here to us. Um, we're trying to jump onto a national program that where we can get additional funding and also uh, work with some of our local people here and some of our developers to get this thing up and running and paid for. But that'll be news coming up. And as soon as we get all put, put together, uh, along with uh, Councilman uh, Mayor Pro Tem Bash and uh, Director uh, Petrie, we're going to put this thing together and get it going. Hopefully have it done within the next two or three years, built and everything. So that's where we're at. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Newton. Just that uh, tomorrow I have CDA board meeting. That's all I have to report. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we got a vector report tonight. Uh, if you'll notice the bug bites in 2020 look like the same way they looked in 1920. And we have a list of bugs and pictures of their bites there. So uh, we didn't put all of them on there. They're about 30 something in all, but I think we only put 10 or 12, didn't we, Matt? But it shows what the bites and what the bugs, that's for this area here. So we do have insects. And that's, that's all we, uh, all we have on that tonight, I gave the RTA report last time, and uh, next week we have RCTC, and then following week we have RTA again. So thank you, everybody. Okay, item two is the city council consent items. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine and may be enacted by one motion. Prior to the motion to consider any action by the council, any public comments are of the consent items will be heard. There will be no separate action unless members of the council or the audience re request specific items to be removed from the council. Consent calendar items removed from the consent calendar will be separately considered under item number three of the agenda. So does anybody want to pull any items? I pull item uh, C is in Charles and G is in George. C and G? Yes, sir. Anybody else? I was going to have to pull C also. Okay. So we'll have a motion to... Motion to approve the rest. Second. Have a motion and a second to approve the remainder. Councilmember Grimmeyer? Yes. Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Yes. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, item three is the items pulled from the consent calendar. Uh, we'll start with you, uh, uh, Ted. Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, Steve, I know you're hiding back there. Uh, the first item on your planning commission, and this is a thank you uh, for working with the church. I know all of us have been involved with that situation for several years, and uh, I want to applaud you and your and the staff for 
for at least trying to get this thing going and for that. So thank you. Um, I know it was a long endeavor, and uh, I know with Andy and uh, John, I'm sure you guys, and Chad back there, I, I think we made progress. So thank you. I don't know how the rest of the council feels. I see some nodding heads, so thank you for doing that. Uh, my second reason is on the zoning change. You want to go ahead and let Kevin talk about that same one? Did you want to talk about the church? Only that I, I don't know how to do this. I, I would approve everything else, but I have to abstain from 5A, the church, because I have a conflict. So how do I do that? Do I just abstain from 5A, or do I stay, abstain from the entire agenda? Actually, you can, you can vote on just approving the action state, because that's not, that's not any substance related to... Okay, so I can just I can just vote on it. Oh, okay. Now, when when it when something related to that comes to the council, that's a different subject, and you'll have to abstain and leave. Okay, that that's all I had. Okay. okay right. Ted, you want to yeah the make zoning a motion to approve that one? Well, it's I can do we can approve both on C and other. I just want to know on the other part on the zoning that's going to come back to the council, right, for final approval. Okay, that's the only thing I wanted to make sure. I didn't know if we approved it here, but we're going to get to come back uh, probably in mid-August, the 19th. Okay, that's the only other thing I wanted to talk about. So with that, if nobody else has any questions, move to approve. Second. Councilmember Grimeyer? Yes. Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Mayor Hanna? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Okay, Ted, you had the next item was... Uh... Yeah, item G. Um, and I, and, and I, this is probably from either Dana or Andy. I'm just curious where it came from. I, uh, we're... It's only... Because, and I didn't know if, some, if the state decided that we had to, to pay everybody or if it's just something. I know it monetarily it's not that big of amount. And I and I'm sometimes when you're on these commissions, you do it, you volunteer, and you work hard on it. Uh, but I just wanted to know where it, the monetary well, came from, or why we, why are we doing it now? Just curious. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it didn't actually come from anywhere other than a matter of consistency, uh, making sure that uh, these folks are paid the same way. Uh, the rest of the advisory uh, bodies of the city council, whether it's streets, trusts, and utilities commission, parks and recs, um, planning commission, uh, historic preservation commission, all of these other advisory bodies are paid um, for attending the, 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 uh, their meetings. And of course, they also have the choice of declining uh, that stipend, and some of them do do that. Um, I, I think uh, this issue um, I, it came to my attention probably when we were forming the uh, Citizens Oversight Committee. I wanted to uh, include compensation because I thought that was the right thing to do. I didn't see that any difference between what they do and what the rest of the advisory bodies uh, do. And at the time, uh, there was I was made to understand that we don't pay advisory councils or, um, or committees. I really didn't probe too much into that. Um, so it's just this is really a clean-up issue uh, to just put everybody uh, on the same, uh, with everyone the same. Thank you, Andy. I, you can go talk to the guys at Rickwell because I don't get paid to sit on that one either. Yeah, so you so <laughs> I don't. But, uh, but thank you. I just I just want to know where it came from, and and I agree with you. We should stay consistent all the way across and not treat anybody different on these. So, unless somebody else has anything to say, anybody got any add to add to it? Um, I'll move to approve. Second. I have a motion and a second. Councilmember Grummeyer. Yes. Councilmember Hoffman. Yes. Councilmember Newton. Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash. Yes. Mayor Hanna. Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Item four is public comments. This is the time when persons <clears throat> viewing, wishing to address the city council regarding matters not on the agenda may be heard. 
Please email the city clerk so that you may be recognized. Please limit comments to three minutes or less. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the city council's ability to respond to comments on non-agendized matters at the time such comments are made. The city council shall not discuss or take action relative to any general public comment. Do we have any uh, public comments? We have no public comments, Mayor. Thank you. Item five is uh, legislative matters. No new evidence will be heard from the public as the public hearing has been closed regarding the items listed. Item A, second reading. John. We have a motion and a second. Councilmember Grummeyer? Yes. Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Yes. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item uh, item six is the city council discussion items. Order of presentation for discussion items. Staff report presentation. Council questions of staff. Public speakers in favor, against, or neutral. Council discussion and action. Item A is uh, Chad. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this item uh, is began last late last year, as you may recall. Uh, some questions arose about how the self hall manuring program was being implemented and was supposed to be managed, uh, and how um, participants were supposed to conduct themselves in in the project. Um, many years ago, the city adopted a self hall program to help facilitate uh, and to help um, residents and businesses. Um, have the choice to self-haul their manure if they chose to. They could stockpile it on site and self-haul it through either the small truck, um, a commercial truck they may have, et cetera, but the intent is that they were self-hauling it, not hiring a third party uh, to conduct that work, and that was the overall intent. Um, somewhere over the last couple of years, the understanding of that requirement got blurred, and some folks, um, uh, have been using third-party vendors, as we found out, um, for several years, in fact, um, to self-haul. In their minds, what's that? So self-haul is third-party vendor. So because of that confusion and some citations that were issued at the time um, because of the violating the self-haul requirement, uh, council directed staff to uh, first and foremost, put a moratorium on uh, citations to look into the issue, to, to review our municipal code, to verify if there's any issues or discrepancies, et cetera, and come back with council with a um, potentially a recommendation whether any changes need to be made to the municipal code or our program, any augmentations that could be made to the services that are provided currently now by waste management. Um, so we kind of figure out what where we stand, maybe what be is better, or options that might help serve our residents better uh, to get them into compliance if that's an, the issue, and to better understand mainly how many really people are out there doing self-haul um, in not the manner that's intended. Um, so as council re recalls, we did do a moratorium, it was intended to be 90 days, that then expanded to uh, up to today at this point. Um, so we're well past the 90 days and, and we extended it basically indefinitely through another motion of the council because we needed more time, especially because of COVID, it was really put things to a halt. Our intent was to come back to you after meeting with waste management, some of the residents, our um, manure subcommittee uh, and staff to uh, bring something back to you to kind of report where we stood, where we think there was issues or not, and kind of give you a recommendation. Um, we did uh, quite a bit of extensive work at, on the staff level in working with waste management because you know one of the issues we want to understand is what are the services we're providing now, maybe where the gaps are that are disenfranchising our residents or businesses to not use them because um, maybe they're just not right sized for them and their needs. Um, 
We want to understand the logistics of what waste management does, what, what the issues of the businesses are and how they perform their, their daily operations for animal keeping and, and manure and how they process and their restrictions or issues on their properties of running space um, and how maybe pickups can't be done because of, of the lack of space there and, and an alternate vendor has other options that waste management doesn't. But primarily, um, through that effort, you know, we tried to figure out where we stood. We certainly found out that we had um, probably about 20 uh, residents slash businesses that were self-hauling. Um, some were self-hauling the right way. Some were self-hauling through third parties. Um, and uh, we also, also found out, and we tried to compare that to the other businesses and residents who were using waste management. and. And we certainly realize there's a myriad of sizes of properties, operations, some using waste management, some not. And one of the primary issues is whether or not we could do something that would allow, because the biggest thing we heard from the folks that were self-hauling using third-party vendors, it is simply and foremost, it's far cheaper to self-haul using these third-party vendors than it is to use waste management. And, the problem become for us as staff is trying to provide a recommendation, you know, do we, there's been the suggestions, do we grandfather these places in, do we give them free pass and allow them to continue to do it, when even though other businesses are using waste management and are doing it the correct way, et cetera. Um, one of the things we can't, we, we, in our discussions as, as the um, subcommittee was, and our basic principle is that the original ordinance was created um, to allow self-haul is to make sure that it allows an option other than waste management, because waste management is our default contract waste hauler for all levels of waste, no matter what it is, and that includes manure. But the self-haul allowed a resident simply bypass waste management and allowed them to self-haul it someplace else and to a proper recycling facility. Unfortunately, that self-haul um, got convoluted where people were now simply just hiring third parties, which is a violation of our contract. Waste management is a defined hauler. No other haulers are allowed. The only exception for haulers in the city are for other governmental agencies, which is like the school district, the prison. They can have their own hauler. Uh, those haulers still pay our um, franchise fee uh, on that, but they can pick whatever hauler they want. So the intent of our self-haul was to allow people to, again, save a little money and self-haul it, and, and they could bypass that. If you needed a manure service, you're supposed to be using waste management. So one of the biggest issues we came to is fairness. Um, and how do we change where we currently have, which is a self-haul ordinance that allows any customer to self-haul. Whether you're a resident or business, you can self-haul equally um, versus creating what I call haves and haves not. So if we grandfathered people in who are currently improperly self-hauling now by using third parties, they are gaining a benefit and an advantage over other folks in the community that can't or are not doing that. They're using waste management or they are you know, self-hauling the right way. And we didn't want to create a list of have and have nots, as I call it, um, creating an unfair economic you know, um, advantage over other businesses that are trying to compete against each other in the city. But in the end, what we ultimately um, came to a conclusion on the subcommittee, um, Councilman Newton and, Cal and, and Councilman Hoffman are on that subcommittee, was uh, not to change our current ordinance other than upgrade the language to make sure it's consistent in our two um, sections. And we have, just to clarify, we have two sections in our municipal code that cover and talk about manure and self-haul. And there's a reason for that. Uh, 6.42 is our, our base um, handling of all trash services, and manure is part of that. Uh, 6.45 specifically was brought in um, in, in the last 10 years because um, we were specifically trying to address and a document to uh, the state who at the time was unsatisfied with our 
compliance in NPDES requirements for managing runoff related to manure and other um, issues uh, in contaminating our potential our, our local waters. Uh, city specifically developed that section to address the city's desire and willingness to um, manage and handle uh, the proper storage of manure uh, and transporting of manure, if you're self-hauling in this particular case, of manure so that it was properly contained and controlled and you weren't getting just the piles sticking out there and run off when storms would come. So that was specifically there. Because one of the comments was made is why don't we just combine the two uh, sections into one and not make it as confusing. My recommendation was to leave them separate because it specifically deals with the questions that the state has for us related to NPDES. What we ultimately did is just made sure that the language regarding self-hauling was absolutely the same in each ordinance, in, e in each section of the, of the municipal code. So that no matter which one you happen to read and not realize there was another section, it still tells you the proper definition of what self-hauling is and how it's to be conducted. The and so ultimately the recommendation um, out of the subcommittee which we bring forth to you today is has multiple parts. Is one is to update the municipal code uh, in both these sections so they're consistent, especially when it comes to self hauling. In that again, self hauling is intent and only purpose is for the homeowner or business owner to self haul using their own equipment and their own uh, staff to take that material to an acceptable and approved location that recycles that material. Because we still want to count that material um, towards our totals and we want to get reports on that material on an annual basis so we can document that with the state. Um, part of the process is we evaluated our um, application and compliance process. Because um, uh, right now we only have five people as of today that are have a an application and a permit to self haul and we know there's a lot more out there um, part of that process is to make sure that staff on our level when people are coming in we're clearly giving them proper description of what self haul is and their requirements and what they're signing and what they're documenting in that doc in that self haul permit of where they're taking the material and who's performing that function and we're following up with them because right now our current application basically indicates that when they reapply for their application on an annual basis, right now it's just annually, that they must give us a minimum number of trip tickets so that we can document that you made efforts and you took them to an appropriate location and then we can count that tonnage and report it to the state. Folks who don't provide that, then we don't renew their um, permit since because they didn't provide evidence they met those requirements. So. Certainly for us I internally as staff is folks in different departments touch different people in regards to getting information. We recognize that folks are coming for a business license and there's information on a business license that talks about if you have horses, are you self-hauling? So part of this is, and, then, so that, and they say yes and they think they're done. And some people are confused, well I signed this and it was read in my permit and I thought I could self-haul now. So part of this is going through our documentation to find out where, what we're communicating to people at different levels and either clear that information up or eliminate it so that we're focused on this is the proper paperwork where we talk about self-hauling. Educating the staff in each department that says when you get these kind of questions, you need to direct them to the right staff, the right department, so that they can be properly um, given the information that's needed to properly self-haul if they want to do it and understand the parameters of that. Um, and so there's a lot of education that we need to do in re-educating our staff, especially because staff changes out. Paperwork we found is, is antiquated, you know, from different departments. So we're going to work together as departments and make sure and, and find out who's got what information. Certainly we have, uh, Public Works has our permit, and that's the master one. But looking at the depart departments, see what might be out there that's caused this confusion. And one of it was related to business licenses. So we're going to resolve that issue and eliminate that, that question because it really is a question that's not needed when somebody's applying for a business license. The, the other element of this is, so how do we resolve this issue moving forward with the existing people that are self-hauling um, using third parties? Uh, ultimately, the subcommittee decided that, number one, update the municipal code so they're correct. 
correct all our in number two correct all informational items that we hand to customers and provide to them number three is we need to get out there and educate and identify all these businesses and give them notification now that they must convert um, to waste management or properly self haul the question is how much time do we want to give them I mean because this is some from this is a big change and ultimately we we elect is let's give them to the end of the year it gives them at least six months at the time when we were trying to bring this forward it was a little bit longer but again with COVID and everything else we were holding off on this discussion because we hope that we'd have public meetings again where folks can come talk about this item but since it's unlikely that this is going to change anytime soon we really wanted to get this change now at least in the municipal code and then we'll start uh, outreaching to all the businesses, all the residents that we know of that doing that are doing self-hauling, even those that aren't, just to make aware of it, and then ourselves and waste management are going to try to work with each of these locations to sit down with them, explain the issues, why we're doing what we're doing, what the purpose is, and find out if we can right-size them, explain what race, waste management's rates are, what services they have. Uh, waste management did just add one additional container this year because uh, prior it was either a two cubic yard bin or 10 cubic yard bin. Now they offer a seven cubic yard bin. So it's trying to find out and educate ourselves but uh, and learn from them is what is your needs, how much are you producing, here's what it would likely cost you based off what you told us in a year. And then they're ultimately gonna have to make that decision to either truly self-haul and what it needs to be done. And what we've learned is it's gotten even more complicated for uh, some of these businesses who used to self-haul. Now the state's regulations regarding qualifications for drivers for any large truck, now they require a higher specialized license, which is discouraging to some of these folks. You know, it's, they couldn't do what they did 10 years ago. Um, and just driving a semi down the road and they could do it. Now you've got to have your specialized license, et cetera. Because one of the larger farmer um, business we went to explained, yeah, we, we stopped doing it because of that reason, but now we're looking at potentially going, my wife, his wife and him getting, go getting their license so they can truly self-haul. But if the city ends up going this route. So there's, there's issues on every side, but ultimately the biggest problem is creating the haves and haves nots versus just the rule in place allows fairness. And we felt that as a staff, as the com as the subcommittee was, we need to do, if we're gonna implement this process, then we need to get out there and make ourselves available as much as we have to, uh, to all these businesses to help work with them so they can um, plan for what this is gonna impact them on their bottom line, how they're gonna notify their customers of, of here's our likely cost, here's what I have to pass to you, et cetera. Because um, keep in mind, there's a lot of businesses that are currently doing the same with waste management now. They, they're they showing that you can survive and you can effectively have a business with waste management. Um, and so it's really, it's it's indicating to them that you can self-haul if you do it this way and it'll be acceptable. If you fail to do that, you would get cited. We would certainly cite the third party and we would most likely send a letter through the city attorney to that third party indicating they must uh, cease and desist in operating in the city. Um, but our goal, assuming tonight the resolu the, the ordinances get passed um, as they're modified and there are minor changes to make sure everything is cleaned up, but the direction uh, um, or the recommendation was that we then outreach to each of these businesses that we know that are self-hauling, whether they're properly doing it or not, uh, and work with them to help them explain that they have the next five to six months to get in compliance as of January 1, we would then um, enact the rules and requirements such that if you were caught self-hauling self with a third party, which is really not self-hauling, um, you would be cited. And and we would explain the process. Now the council is aware of this issue. We've, you know, because they're gonna be right back here going, we don't understand. We at least wanna document, demonstrate the staff has gone out and tried to outreach to everybody we possibly could or knew of to explain that issue. So that is our, our proposal and game plan of how to address this issue. Um, I welcome any comments or considerations or suggestions you have regarding uh, things we might want to consider as we move forward, if it ultimately this is something the council wants to do. Uh, but, um, and we can certainly come back again and talk about the plan or however we want to do this, but uh, like obviously tonight's really just about updating the ordinance, make sure they're correct. Um, 
but this is the recommendation at this time as far as what the subcommittee came uh, ultimately decided on and would put forth to the entire council. If I could also add a few more comments to supplement what Chad said. Uh, in addition to the challenges of determining where we draw this line that will be acceptable to both residents and West management uh, with respect to who is allowed to, to self haul using third party and who is not, um, recognizing the uh, franchise agreement that we have with West management. I do want to point out there are some other implementational issues that we looked at. Uh, just to, to level the playing field here, is that if we are to allow third parties to come into this business and do uh, self-haul on behalf of uh, some residents, uh, there are some other issues we have to deal with, such as uh, liability-related issues. Uh, what level of performance bonds do they have to provide? They would have to provide general liability workers' comp liability and all the insurance requirements in order to be able to, to do that type of business here in the city of Narco, uh compatible to what, what is required of West management to do the same. Um, we also talked, I think Chad mentioned the reporting requirements and, and, and also the equipment requirements. Uh, also to be factored in our processes uh, the, ability, the ability to pay franchise fee, I know Chad I did uh, mention that, but I do want to reemphasize that because that is uh, a way that uh, we have to, uh, again, level the playing field. Uh, we can't uh, subject some residents to paying franchise fees, whereas others who are using these third party haulers are not, are not in fact, uh, doing that. So these are some implementational issues we, have, we considered uh, in terms of uh, trying to uh, come up with any walkable solution. Unfortunately, uh, there wasn't that too many options out there that we think are uh, uh, viable other than uh, trying to get everybody uh, management as well as provide some more other, uh, this education and some additional um, uh, potential service levels for those who have large amounts of money. Chad, before we start on the question, I got one. Uh, how many did you say were licensed to self haul? Currently, we only have five people for this current calendar year that have a permit. Okay. All right. Okay, who wants to start, Ted? You know, I, I do, but I think first check with Dana because I looked through the. This is a very important issue here in town, and so I wanted to see. From Dana, do we have any public comments? Anybody said anything on there? I'm just curious. We've received no public comments on this. I've received no calls either. Okay, because, and just checking the thing, there's nine people watching this, the, the council, and I was probably one of them, so that's eight. So that's, I'm just, we have to, the residents have to understand that we've been a long time, and they, this is, this would have been their opportunity to get involved. Um, so, if we approve this thing tonight, and then it goes to a second reading, so that be mid-August, 30 days after that, it would get approved. Is that the way it works? Uh, correct. It goes in the force. And I agree with you, Chad, that because this is such a sensitive issue, that we need to have that, to extend that out until the first of the year before we do a lot of warnings and a lot of education. Because it's going to, this affects... Like Kevin's going to tell me, this affects the horsekeeping in town, how we huddle for some of these large ranches. And uh, he's beat this into me that the fact that everything we do, we're scaring away the horse owners here in town because of the manure. I don't want to do that. So, uh, but we're stuck. And it is. And, and I'm glad you guys cleaned that up, by the way. So my next question is is to Lizette. Did we clean up that application when somebody turns in a business license saying we're in the horse business and that little application, that little card that said, oh, I self-haul, that's all gone? You probably weren't aware of that one. Do you remember one, Brian? You are aware of it. Nobody even knows where this form came from. So apparently a form that has been in existence for 
before anybody that is currently here, we don't we don't even know how it, it got started. Uh, certainly, we don't think it's a form that we need uh, because we don't know the purpose of it. And uh, a business license would not be uh, using those forms or or sending it out to people. I don't even know where to get it from. So that's something we need to plug that hole. So that's gone. Good. If All it's right. not, it will be. Yeah, it will be if it's not. Okay, well, just wherever, you, wherever that came from, we have to get rid of that because yeah. that was that was confusing. Because I said, okay, uh, so you want to tell me there's five self haulers? That's all we got right now. Correct. How many do we anticipate? I thought we had at least more when we looked at that list. Oh, we do. I mean, I, I, well, again, the, the legal. Okay. Or five. Um, when, la when we started this process, we're looking at it. We we had probably s when we started the, looking at this in 19, we had six. So a lot of these were carried over. Um, there are many that are, we know are self-hauling because when we pulled the business licenses and compared them to the services that they currently have, several of them didn't have waste management for manure, but we know there are a, an animal keeping property. So, and then just talking with some of these businesses or residents, they confirmed, yeah, we, we self-haul and or we are using a third party. We have there was at least 20 or 30, correct? Uh, there's about 25, I believe. Okay, yeah, because I remember that we had that that number came up. Between the 25, I think we determined there's actually three different cell haulers that people are using. And you guys identified them, and you've contacted all those people. Okay. Um, and I'm, and I appreciate waste management working on the seven yard bin. Again, we have to make this comfortable for the residents and how what they can afford. So. Update the code, the trip tickets. Oh, that's all questions. Thank you. Evan. <clears throat> who, who all was on that committee? Um, Councilman Hoffman, Councilman Newton, myself, uh, Andy, um, Brian, Petrie. Residents? Uh, no, it was just the subcommittee. Um, were any residents contacted about this meeting tonight? <laughs> Other than the public notice, n no. Um, and so, basically, residents just so weird. Does the school district and does Riverside City College? And government agencies are given the opportunity to negotiate for a better deal. Right. Residents will not be. They, they, Go ahead. Sure. Oh, just, I might indicate that it's statutory. It was no, I, no, it was it's, no, this is nobody's fault. Was, yeah, no, I'm just saying that, that, that the exclusion for other entities, particularly the school district, was, was the subject of much litigation in, uh, in the statute. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand all that. Um, I, I'm, well, I'll leave, I'll leave it for comments. Thank you. That's all I have, Mr. Mayor. Robin. John, I just have a couple of questions for clarification on process and a couple of things you mentioned. So at this point in time tonight, you're just asking for an approval of an ordinance and cleaning up the municipal code. Then it would roll into an educational campaign, which you mentioned would uh, you would partner with waste management. So what is waste management's role and what do they contribute to the education campaign process? Part of that's going to be... Um, the city and waste management working uh, together to, to develop specific material that we can use to um, target specifically for self-hauling and, and manure uh, that will discuss not only the self-haul process and how it's supposed to be done and obviously advising people that if you're doing it the incorrect way that, that it will be subject to uh, fines beginning January 1, etc. But however, the city and waste management want to work with you to discuss your needs and issues to find out wh how we can maybe right size you uh, to the right level of services that meet your needs. Uh, asking to set up and work with them to get an appointment, to maybe meet with them on site, to review their process, to understand how they how they operate on a daily basis, to, to find out really how they're operating now and, and how maybe waste management can fill that role. And, and so we can give them the education of, of, of the bins and size that are available, the costs that it would likely occur, and that way they can make an educated decision of what will work for them, whether or not self-hauling in the true way, if, if that works for them or if, and or how it will, co what will, the, will cost them to do the proper way of using uh, waste management as the hauler versus a third party hauler. So our goal is to try to 
get in front of them and then talk to them. Because again, there's certainly a lot of people we haven't had an opportunity to talk to about this. We've had a few folks that invited us on their property so we can see what was going on and share their experience in using some of these third party haulers and why they use them. Now it's really just trying to outreach them and tell them, look, here's what, if it's determined um, that the city um, and council wants to use the policy as it is now, continue the grace period that's there and then educate work with them that January 1 is the date. You need to get in compliance at that point, whether you get in compliance now or you just wait till then to get the bins that are required. After that point, you can and will be cited. And if the issues come back to council again, the understanding would be, it's, well, this is what we decided on as a, as a council. And this is, this is the process, et cetera. So we just, my goal is to get out there and just talk with people and explain to them, and do, what can I give them to help them understand as much as possible their options and, and what they need to do to comply. Okay, so specifically, would waste management provide printed materials, social media materials? They would provide staff to go with you for on site visits and education with these, like specifically, have those things been agreed upon in the subcommittee that waste management would provide X, Y, and Z? Um, I don't know if they were agreed upon, but that is certainly the expectation. That is my expectation, um, and I've already expressed that, and I've gotten the concurrence from Waste Management. That's what they will do. They understand that this is a significantly important issue to this community. Um, they were at these field meetings. They were there to observe and ask questions, et cetera. They, they understand that this is not something small and that they need to offer more. And the, one of their efforts was, again, to provide a different type of bin, but it's they understand uh, my expectation of them is they're going to be out there giving me the literature, working, printing it out, doing, like I said, uh, networking with the residents in hand with us, not by themselves, because I want them to understand the residents that this is the city informing us, not waste management trying to garner more business. This is the city trying to work with you to get in compliance. Waste management is here to facilitate and ask particular questions that they're best to help answer as far as how the service would be done, what's the limitations, do I have to do improvements on my property for you to gain access, things like that. They'll be in part of the discussion, but it will be a true partnership you know, to get this process and to get this information out. And so will it be people from your department mm -hmm. going with waste management? Most likely because I have been spearheading this whole thing, it will be me directly okay. working okay. with waste management, and they usually have three different people. Um, it'd be uh, Glenda, Lizette, and uh, I think it's Manuel, um, that's in the, which is their, their on field, outfield service person, meeting with each individual, explain this is how it would occur, this is what we can okay. do. Okay. So, on the educational campaign, moving to kind of the general topic, what does that look like to you? Is that um, rolling it out in top stories? A couple of times spaced out is that putting something in a utility bill that every single resident gets because you've said that there's approximately 25 so we could guess there's probably more that we don't know about okay. so what are we going to do to make sure that this education campaign is truly community-wide and reaching everyone that we potentially need to meet considering that I think we rely on social media a lot and a lot of people just have kind of shied away from certain types of social media um, just to, I guess, make their lives less stressful, probably. And so what are we going to do as far as that campaign and making sure everybody is is accessed or reached with the information? I certainly envision, in general, we would use all the social media options to um, inform people about what we're trying to do, what's going on. But we would have a much more robust, specific target of, of outreach and material to certainly the first and foremost those folks that we believe are the, our target audience and talk with them and, and, and continually work with them and try to get them, because my goal is to get a meeting with them. I want them to know that they just didn't get a piece of paper and they were informed that I can say I talk with this individual, this group, and say we gave them the information. I purposely met with them, waste management met with them, and we gave them all that we can, and it's now a decision they have to make what they want to do. Do they want to do self-haul the right way? Are they going to continue on the way they were doing? Or are they going to convert to waste management? But our goal is to outreach to the ones we think we know are the, are the largest target uh, folks that we, we've heard of and we've cited before and work with them in giving the extra. Other than that, we will always use the general social media um, to, uh, and that's why I want to create my envision of creating generic flyers and information that gives a pe per people an update and reminders about 
uh, manure and self-hauling in the program, but give more targeted information uh, to those folks that, that we know of and are aware of or that we find out about during the process. So though I envision various levels of communication that hasn't been developed yet because I didn't really develop anything until I kind of understood and it ultimately if there's a consensus to move this direction. And then it would be you know myself and uh, Kelly Newton and, uh, and Waste Management kind of figuring out what types of flyers we're gonna develop, how they would look, et cetera, and how we get that message out. Okay, so just to kind of tie into that a little bit, if we're just gonna do kind of a general, I would request that we look at um, the manure cleanliness, which sounds really weird, but I know each year we get that standard letter, like there's a bunch of trash in your manure, we're gonna increase your rates by X, Y, Z. And so if we're already going to have waste management creating literature and doing those things, I would ask that we kind of make it a little bit broader in that sense so that we can kind of tackle a couple of issues regarding manure at one time that people know it's important that even if you just have the cart the black cart that goes out to the street your manure still needs to be clean free from trash and debris all of that kind of stuff and then put an option on there are you interested in a visit from city staff and or waste management to look at what your protocols are at your place and is there a way you can save money? Because when we got the waste management stuff the other day, I was sitting there doing the math. Is it better for me to have a black bin or is it better for me to do the other one? And I think if we're gonna have this outreach that offering that to anybody that wants that service is definitely um, something that we should provide. And then my last question is with an implementation date of January 1, 2020, will we at that point start with warnings and then move into the citations and not hit people with citations right off the bat or what do you envision that looking like? I don't think we've gotten that far as far as when the clock strikes, how are we going to do it? Um, we might take a softer approach, kind of like we've done with the uh, weed abatement, and say, okay, we're okay. going to give you a gentle reminder. We, we, have, we remind them we sent this material, you should have received it. In case you didn't, here it is, X, Y, Z. Um, and then after that, it'd be a citation. So probably the best thing is to do with that approach. We hadn't discussed it to, yet, but it's probably be a better way, is okay. to kind of give it an advanced warning. All right, thank you. Councilman Grimmer, normally we'll do that in this case with a compliance notice. And then that is typically, that runs from 10 or 30 days. We can talk about that. That allows them to go back and figure out self-haul or sign up with waste management. And then upon that, we re-inspect. If they've got it all in place, we move down the road or we sign. Greg? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I want to thank staff um, and Council Member Hoffman uh, for all the time that you put in uh, on this topic al al along with the subcommittee. Um, I have a, a couple of questions. They somewhat parallel uh, Council Member Grunmeyer's uh, comments. Um, kind of hindsight, I, I think we kind of got into this whole mess and all this trouble because we didn't have a clear direction, not we didn't have clear paperwork. Um, and, and we'll be able to get that straightened out. Uh, so one of my questions is for Lissette, as far as uh, finance department, how much time do you think you're gonna need to make sure we're all on the same page with staff and public works um, as far as having this all concise and ready to present to the public. Well, in, Just a guesstimate. In, in updating yeah. our business license forms, I, I know some of them, like Chad said, they've been there for years in, in practice, so that's something that could easily, you know, in a couple of weeks, we could go through them and see what changes, you know, remove anything regarding self-haul uh, questions from those forms, making sure they're not online as well. So I'm thinking a couple weeks just to review all those forms, updating those forms and, you know, having IT uh, upload them in the, in the website. Um, now with the procedures on this, 
when currently when we get any questions regarding South Hall, we do refer them back to Public Works, um, to Shannon Dahl to uh, give them the South Hall permit. We don't do that process. Okay. So do you think a, a month, couple of months to maybe where we're all coordinated and ready to roll that out as far as your end, not not with the outreach yet, just with your specific end. With the, with us, it should be you know within probably two to three weeks. It oh, okay. All, all right. I may recall, um, I think part of the confusion was there was this mystery paper that no one understood right. that had a line on there that talked about do you do you self haul and, and or how many horses you have and and but we knew no one could even answer what was the form for. So the reality is, is all we were aware of is that form, just get rid of it. Because we right. don't know where it came from. We don't know where it is. So at this point, just stop using it. And then there are no other forms other than the one that Public Works issues. Because we're almost starting over and for the benefit of the rest of the council. The, in our one of our first subcommittee meetings, the list we were given of all the self-haul participants it was all over the place. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was people you know didn't self-haul, were listed as self-haul people, and it was just, it was a complete mess. And, and, and where Chad mentioned, you know, we know that there's actually legitimately maybe four or five that were, you know, proper today. I don't know what that list had, 30 or 40 names and yeah, I mean, no, it was just, we, we took the... It was a shotgun approach. Yeah, and the list that the, the Councilman Newton's referring to is we, since I only had about five to six people actually signed up, and we knew there were a lot more, is trying to figure out who they might be, is we pulled the business licenses for animal keeping. And then from that, I actually pulled the uh, um, utility bills for those businesses and determined which ones said waste management, which one didn't. So then we can identify, okay, all these folks on this list that we believe have animal keeping, the others that don't, anyone doesn't have waste management is doing something else. So that's what I think what Councilman is referring to. Yeah. We had this list that was all over the place. So I appreciate that, Chad. Um, I guess some of my concerns with this also is um, I have no confidence in waste management to participate in the outreach as, as I think you're expecting them to do that. Yeah, that burden's going to be all on staff, and um, I just don't see where they're motivated. Um, I didn't get that read from them in the subcommittee meetings that we had, other than uh, maybe they'll participate with some, you know, printing or some printing brochures that we would develop. Um, like I said, I, I don't have the confidence in them to uh, really participate in outreach that's going to be city and city staff and then that also is going to be very limited um, another part of my reason for that is that w with all the conversations we had with with our last contract a few meetings ago that the only th really thing they came up with was um, we'll, we'll offer you a seven yard uh, uh, low boy bin uh, to dump your manure in, uh, which will be less money. And of course it'll be less money because the capacity is less, but the trucking cost is exactly the same because it's the same truck, whether it picks up a seven yard bin or a, a 30 yard container. So I have concerns about that. Um, and I guess what's difficult for me is that I appreciate all the, like I said, all the work that Ted's put into it and staff's put into it. I just feel we're missing something that this is a solution. It it's doable and possibly workable, but there's something missing and I don't I just don't know what it is. But other than my gut feeling that we we're going to postpone this to the end of the year. Um we're not going to really be able to have any public outreach or public contact with the people that will self-haul at the end of the day. Um, I just maybe we're just getting a little ahead of ourselves with this, and it wouldn't bother me if we wait till the first of the year um, before we move forward. Um, with this whole, you know, with the whole program and saying, 
you know, January 1st, here's going to be your reminder and, you know, we're going to be under the gun. We'll have everything all in, all the whole process ready to go. I've just, there's something missing, but I can't tell you what it is. And that's all I have right now, Mayor. And I think to that comment, just sure. uh, again, this is not a, a frozen issue or stat. I mean, we can always come back and engage this issue again if that magic bullet shows up, if we kind of figure out something that works. So we're never, you know, stuck with this solution yeah. again. And I welcome a solution that somehow helps out the community. But for right now, we're limited in the requirements of our agreement the expectation of our code enforcement to enforce the rules that we have out there that we've been asked for right now to not enforce and and so it's just us trying to fix what what we we recognize we contributed in the process by not properly informing and our residents when they're coming to the counter and explaining to them having the right information online so we're to blame on this process and and we're not we're not diverting from that and so and part of that process is our urgent desire is to get out and educate the people again now that we have an understanding that there probably won't be this magic bullet that we're going to use because we haven't figured it out yet that at least let's get the start of that education as much as we can an opportunity to meet with them one-on-one -on -one and but have an end date say look at this point this is where we need everybody in compliance otherwise everybody will ignore it because there is no finality date for what it's worth um, but it doesn't mean we can't come back to this and engage it again and again at another time where folks can come to the meeting and give their feedback and talk about their stories. Um, but we have talked with a lot of those folks that have those homes, and I unfortunately don't have. The councilman talked about a, a solution because if we let them continue to use the third-party hauler, we're in violation of our agreement with waste management. And it just doesn't look good if we're having a blind eye to our obligations to, to help Right, I mean, our, our desire to help out our community, and that's where we're stuck. Um, but it might be ultimately the magic bullet might be looking at when the next contract comes up and finding a better service. What that is that's included that they must bring to the table that does this thing. And since we've learned these lessons, that if you're going to be a hauler, you must have this type of service where you do come and you pick up the manure and you with the tractor and you haul it off. And what's that cost? And but for right now, we don't have that ability to to do that but that's certainly something we'll keep in our head when we're talking with future well we've been looking haulers. for that magic bullet for years <laughs> and well, excuse me i know ted you we've all spent enough time on trying to you know what system what's out there that's going to work and from digesters to briquettes i think was the last one we had a guy from florida mm -hmm. you know it's just like there's something out there. I don't know if that's what my gut's telling me or not, but it it's not, hey, I'll give you a seven yard bin, you know, for thirty dollars less a month. There's there's a bigger answer out there. So thank you, Mayor. Kevin, did you have more? If if if, if we're getting to the comments part, remember it is I'm sorry, it isn't a public, a public hearing. Card. Yeah, that's right. And so. but but we have no cards, is that correct? We have no public comment this time. So I appreciate the work. I, I, when I look at these views, I try to look at the big picture. How do we protect animal keeping in the city of Norco? Because animal keeping to outsiders is it's a hobby. And to us, it's a lifestyle. Uh, for me, Greg, what's missing is the public. Where are they? And I am not going to vote for this until I hear from the public. Um, I totally get that we're out of compliance, but I also I go back to the original idea of the scout service. And I've tried many times to get a discussion, and nobody wants to discuss it. That was a catastrophic move for animal keeping in the city of Norco. So now this was prompted by residents. And I don't even know if they know this is happening. And they're going to say this is done in the dark of the night, which it kind of is. And we're going to look at January 21. We're in the middle of a pandemic. And people are flat out terrified. And we're trying to maintain a lifestyle in the midst of a terrifying pandemic. 
And I really, truthfully, I think in many, many ways, I don't think anybody in this room, I'm not pointing fingers whatsoever, but I do believe many of our legislators are inured against it. They, they do not know what's going on. So I have, I won't support January 21. I totally get the contract. I totally agree with Greg. You know, I thought we were going to get all kinds of help from waste management in this contract, which I did not vote for. But I thought they'd be right on board. I mean, when we call Glenda, we call them. They're Johnny on the spot for us. But to my mind, I don't think they're going to help us with this. And besides, what are they really going to do? And a lot of people just can't afford to get the manure off their property. I think that the whole, I'm really disappointed that, I mean, going back to the accessory building thing, the paperwork, the application from 2010 was never changed. Planning commissioners didn't even know what the law said. And now I'm hearing we have another one. I mean, maybe one of the things we need to do is put a committee together and, you know, I hate to do that to staff because staff is being impacted by this pandemic. I don't understand why the, the I thought that the subcommittee was going to have at least a couple of residents in it. And so for me, I would love to postpone this and make sure we notify Lori, we notify, we notify some of the people, all the people that spoke that night and tell them we are going to be hearing this issue, tell them the truth, we've got a contract with waste management, we have a difficulty, and I would like to postpone this vote because the thing for me ultimately is the public. And I think we can figure it out that they can speak and they can talk, They because otherwise they're gonna look at this and say, oh, look what they did. And ultimately we can't solve, the truth is we can't solve their problem, which is they can't afford to get the manure off their property which means that's another slug of horses that may be leaving the city of Norco. So, and again, I'm not, I'm not coming down on you. It's, it's, it's everybody here it, it knows what the problem is. But I won't be supporting this until I can see some people standing at the podium and letting me know how they feel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If, if I can comment just very quickly, what you really have before you tonight as a practical matter is simply making clear what your current ordinance says so that it's not inconsistent. Uh, if you don't do anything tonight or in the future, we have the current ordinance which says the same thing, has the same uh, impacts that you're concerned about. Uh, so it's really almost kind of steps. One is, is the ordinance. Second is that point in time in which you enforce it. Uh, third is figuring some way of not having to have this kind of ordinance. But if you can figure out a way to get that out to the public and make them understand what you just said, but the reality is that's actually, we all understand it, but what you just said is extremely complicated, especially when people are terrified, John. Nothing. So, and I totally understand where you're coming from. And for me, again, the thing missing is I need, I need to hear from the public and I'm I have a lot of work, but thank you. That's all I have. Mr. Mayor, if I can. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Chad, initially when we looked at this, there were two, they had the ordinance, which you have here, which we had to fix. There wasn't there another section that was not written clearly, that it didn't talk about self-haul and the obligations on self-haul? One of the two, you mean? Yeah, the two of the two. Uh, they both talked about it, but one wasn't as detailed as the other, because one was specifically written to deal with self-hauling, and the other one mentioned it in passing. How, how so you now had we, the... Now we made them exactly the same, so they are very detailed, and they duplicate each other. They're just two different rep, two different chapters. Okay, so but we cleaned that one up. Absolutely. That was one of the things we pointed out. I think that's what out. John was pointing out, is that we cleaned up that mess. But I'm kind of with Kevin. It's, this is... Like I said, when I checked Matt, Matt can probably tell me how many how many people are viewing this now, Matt. Eight. This is very important. I mean, this is, and, you know, I know we put out the public notices and things like that, and and nothing against staff because that's that you do exactly what you're supposed to do, but uh, this is tough to get the people behind it and, and figure out what we need to get done, uh, and not listening to them because it, it does affect property. Uh, we can clean it up 
and at least that part, but I don't think we ought to do any enacting. And I understand on this thing for a while. The other thing is we also have an obligation because we have a contract with waste management. And so to your knowledge, Chad, is there any, are those third haulers, third party haulers still working? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Every day if you yeah. look around, you'll see those big black dump truck, Correct. dump yeah. trailers. It just just for the town, enforcement, right? we are not enforcing that. Right. So there are self haulers in town doing that. Um, the only time we do enforce is if the, we have excessive manure in a complaint on a property, then we do enforce that. Well, but then I'm I'm worried there. Just just for clarification, so I can and I'm just going to go on lines hey. of, of the city attorney. And tonight is mainly about coming back to you with the modifications that clean up the ordinance, which were part of the problem. In addition to that was to kind of explain our our grander plan, which I'm not expecting you to approve tonight, but I want to give you the full picture of what we're doing. It's not just this and nothing else. It does not mean if we're good we can't come back with a uh, planned meeting that we notice and put information out there that we're going to have this discussion about uh, uh, potentially having a deadline. The deadline or the... the um, uh, direction that you put in place or order that you put in place to not enforce um, uh, citations is still in effect. Uh, that doesn't go away. It's still in effect because we specifically stated that it will stay in effect until COVID-19 issues and public meetings can resume. Um, so, and that hasn't happened yet. So unfortunately, and, and so it doesn't mean we can't come back. What I'm hoping to do is I don't want to wait to a meeting to start outreaching. So I want to start the education now because, again, even when they finally come in, you're going to have folks in here who are going to complain that they are the, they're going to be hurt by forcing them to do that. But you're also, what you're probably not going to get is the folks that are, are using waste management the correct way right now. They are paying likely more uh, and operating their businesses. Um, and we don't really have the magic bullet, even if they come in and tell you the, the story that they have about their business. So at worst case scenario, my hope was just get consensus that you want me to start in outreaching to folks about our ordinance, our requirements, and, and, trying, to, and trying to work with these residents to right size. I, we are not gonna cite them. We have not been citing them. That's been stopped a long time ago. At some point, we will need to decide um, as a city when to uh, lift that um, order so that then we would uh, then enforce it. Um, so, but again, tonight is really just about bringing this back because it's been a long time coming. We didn't want to keep dragging this out. We wanted to bring it to you. And this is part of the solution is com making sure our two sections that talk about manure and self haul are consistent and accurate. After that, it's really at your pleasure what you want staff to do. I'm ready to start in a process, whatever you think that might be. I just can't predict when a public meeting will occur that they can functionally be here in front of you to talk about their concerns. Yeah, so if we we can clean these up tonight and then come back later with a public meeting, let the people come in just like they did for the egg ranch property. Correct. Because Absolutely. I remember when this came up before, there was a lot of people showed up and everything and they're concerned and they have a right to get up here and speak. So I have no problem if we just clean this up. Mr. Mayor. I do have one other comment on this, if I can. It's directed at you, John and Randy. Um, we have a contract with waste management. I mean, how much... I don't think waste management would do anything, but they could. Essentially, if we continue to allow these third-party haulers in violation of their contract, so how much liability to accept if we well, don't do anything at all. We certainly have some contractual liability to waste management. To the, you're right to the extent that which they would uh, take action to attempt to enforce it. Who knows? I expect that they can put a dollar number on what it might cost them. But the what I was going to say before you uh, commented that uh, we're, we really can't blame this entirely on the existence of a contract. Uh, that's certainly true, but the issues that Andy commented on are significant issues for liability and for other reasons. That the performance bonding, that the uh, general liability and workers' comp, those kinds of issues. Uh, s some way, I mean, even if we pretended 
that waste management is going to say, oh, forget it, it's not worth the fight. We're going to have to figure some way, and this is really the issue, of treating third-party haulers the same way that we would any other franchisee. I mean, essentially, we're granting baby franchises because otherwise, I mean, maybe you got the big black haulers, but you also got, I can remember back in the old days, the guys doing it in their pickup trucks. Uh, there has to be some means of controlling, and we have to get credit for it. The the complications related to to waste management in general are so much more complicated than they were even five years ago. Uh, and the, the obligations of the city in terms of, of uh, not only their liability, but accounting to the state for and the impact of not accounting, all those things, it's a different ball game entirely. And we have a difficult time allowing third party haulers who don't meet all the standards and don't provide the information of hauling even if waste management didn't have a problem with it. And, and that has to be part of the, I think, the outreach as well so that people understand it's not simply, uh, well, uh, the statute says that we can contract for ex uh, uh, to grant an exclusive franchise. That's what how municipal stuff works, uh, and so we're stuck. It's the other issues that are now kind of related to that that are just as significant as the contract issues. That's it, Mr. Mayor. Okay, anybody want to make a motion? I, I absolutely understand what you're saying. And in fact, we had a former council member here who was a pretty savvy guy in his day. But the truth of the matter is, he was a, from a dinosaur age. And he totally did not understand. And that's a smart guy. And nothing against him. But the reality is, is that explanation you just gave is something the public needs to hear. And I'm just, I thought the public was going to be engaged in this. And they haven't been. Well, and again, I think that I'll go back. No, I, I, mean, I, I do understand what you're trying to do, but the public should be here. They should understand that this this process is is we're trying to. It's it is a new ball game. I mean, so for for example, I mean again, I, I've said this already once, but really all that you're doing tonight is cleaning up what amounts to ambiguous language in the code without changing. Anything. If we wanted to cite people today, we could cite people today under the code. Uh, that doesn't change. So maybe, I mean, we don't know when the virus stuff is going to be gone and when we can have public meetings, but maybe uh, there's a commitment on your part, whether waste management likes it or not, not to do anything until you have the opportunity to have a publicly noticed public meeting, not to talk about the contract obligations, but to talk about the other issues and whether there are other solutions. So you want to make a mayor? Yes, sir. Still got a couple of questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> would it be possible? Uh, try and also think with this motion uh, to continue this ordinance. Let's, let's just say off calendar for now, but uh, being aware of that, uh, we're going to. I'm asking that you you have a uh, time schedule, a time frame, you know, for your outreach, your um, in, internal controls, that that whole program that you're going to develop. But but these three concerns that Andy brought up about these outside haulers, okay, is there anything that in our present ordinance that uh, we don't even know who they are? At, at this point in time as far as outside haulers yeah oh yeah we know who they are okay yeah is there anything in in our ordinances today that would allow you to contact them and say you need to meet these three requirements well, no because currently the city manager we don't allow third-party haulers so that's that's the, we because we don't allow it per our contract. Right. There is nothing or that would um, 
condition to allow that. That would be a, and that's one of the things we actually talked about in our subcommittee was, right. if we did it, what would it require logistically, how much staff time it would cost to track all these third-party haulers to make sure they have the right insurance, uh, business license, you know, everything they're supposed to have, that they're turning in all their, their tickets, et cetera, et cetera. How much administrative does that create work for staff to, to follow what will likely be even more people once they hear, oh, you can do this. Um, and then does it open Pandora's box for the other services, regular traffic, recyclables? Right. Mm -hmm. We go down that road. So right now, no, there's nothing in this ordinance and uh, that would give any indication that could be possible or what they would have to meet. Um, one of the reasons I'd, I would like to get this passed tonight, because really this helps clean up the paperwork, because people still can come today and get a self-haul permit. This program is still active, and by cleaning this up, this makes sure that from this point going forward that we have consistency and it's accurate and and so it doesn't change anything negatively for anybody um, we're still not citing um, and and there's no end to that in sight at this point we have no con consensus yet about when we're going to allow us to cite again you know and because we haven't come up with the final plan so that I certainly welcome I'm happy with delaying that part of it um, till we have more time do we have more participation that is no problem for me at all but it, I wanted to bring this back because it's been so long. I want to at least say, here's what we've come up with. Here was our discussion. And that the way you, uh, the full council can say, what do we want to do? My hope is at least the bare bones was that the, the, that the subcommittee term is, yes, do these fixes because it cleans it up. It doesn't mean we can't come back later on if your discussion is to change this again, to do some other program, to do a, a, some accommodations. But for right now, this at least helps me be accurate and consistent and clean when I'm giving a self-haul permit and people are coming to ask. I could say, here's the requirements and here's the regulations and they're consistent with each other. Yeah. So that's how it benefits us now. I mean, wh one of the comments that you made that I was going to make, but you kind of jumped in a little ahead, and that really is the elephant in the room, is if we allow third-party haulers that meet these requirements, and we're happy, they're essentially baby franchisees, uh, how does that affect the other types of services? What if a homeowners association comes to you and says, man, I can get this stuff cheaper. Uh, what if uh, a, a block or five homes say, well, you know, we'll, we'll self-haul under this. We'll have that guy that you approved uh, that's hauling manure. He'll, he's gonna stop by our place and pick it up and he's all good to go. Those are things we obviously can't do under the current uh, contract or any municipal franchise contract and but are going to raise probably significant issues in the community uh, so really to think about I mean granted manure is a, a slightly different subject and probably can be treated by itself but there's going to have to be some real good reasons why we do that and and not that there aren't any but that but if we had allowed third party dollars and there was no objection. There are real good reasons why we're doing that and why it shouldn't apply across the board. Just to be clear, I want to, for waste management's benefit, this was not a waste management generated issue. They did not identify this as a problem. They did not say they have an issue. They weren't calling me saying, you've got people out there. This was our staff enforcing the municipal code citing people for the municipal code that got residents upset that started the discussion and so this is by no way or any shape some form waste management is out there banging the door saying the city's not doing what you're supposed to be doing they've cooperated with us they've participated they've, they've answered our questions but this is definitely not something that they're pushing on us that we're not doing something yeah. this really uh, i think in large part came from a cease and desist letter that i sent to uh a, 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 a hauler, that, uh, yeah, a hauler. But, but what they do is manufacture or dry out and sell fertilizer, and that this has been their source, and they're the ones that generated the excitement when they got letters saying, "We, you can't do this anymore because Norco was a principal source of their product, which they would sell to somebody else. They weren't waste haulers; they were uh, fertilizer manufacturers." Greg, did you want to make the motion? <laughs> Ted? I 
don't like it, but I'm going to. And I'll need to clean this thing up because that's, I think, is our problem as we clean this ordinance up. So I will make a motion to approve this ordinance, but I will not put, agree to the effective date, 30 days. And we're not asking that. That's okay, not part of but this. But that's part, it's in your resolution. It's just, inform it's yeah. just information. Th that's just the when a st uh, an ordinance becomes effective by statute. Yeah, that's first right. reading, second reading, 30 days. But if you do nothing tonight, the yeah, these rules are still in place today. Uh, the only reason they're not being enforced uh, is because you've said don't enforce it. And that's what so I'm that, saying is it's not going to get enforced. There's nothing it, here that says... This doesn't change anything in terms of the legal application of this right. ordinance. Yeah, right. There's no language in, in the ordinance that says that this rescinds anything as far as uh, citations or anything. It just says that no, but 30 it does, days... No, but it does active. the 30 days. It becomes effective yeah. 30 days. Yeah, yeah. But that, it's, but it's information. What, yeah, yeah, that's, what, the that's what the statute requires. Okay. I mean, that's... Yeah. That's when it's effective under the statute. That's the only thing you're approving. And effective tonight. only means that the language is changed from what it says today to what it says here without having changing the legal effect. Okay. So make a motion to approve this uh, chapter 6.42. Missile Refuse Manure and Recycling Collection in Chapter 6.45, City Manure Management and Disposal Code Amendment 2020.5. I'll second. An ordinance of the City Council of the City of Norco, California, amending Norco Municipal Code Chapter 6.42, Municipal Refuse Manure and Recycling Collection in Chapter 6.45, City of Norco Manure Management and Disposal Code Amendment 2020-05. And we'll vote. Councilmember Grummeyer? Yes. Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Mayor Pro Tem Bash? No. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Motion passes with um, Councilmember Newton, no, and Mayor Pro Tem Bash, no. Okay, we'll move on to item B as a uh, fiscal year 2020 2021 measure our budget recommendations for various projects and programs. This is the city manager and the finance director. Good evening, young lady. How are you doing? Good. Good evening, council members. Um, I'm here to provide the measure our citizens oversight committee. Um, they had reviewed the staff's recommendation budget request for the fiscal year 2021 measure our uh, request and they're forwarding it um, in order to get the uh, projects approved by city council for funding. On July 22nd, 2020, um, the COC approved the 2021 measure our budget in the amount of 3.3 million this, for various operating expenditures and capital projects. Uh, COC recommends that City Council approve these recommended budgets that are listed on Attachment A. On the attachment, there's a couple of things I want to uh, point out. When Measure R started the first year um, that the tax was um, implemented in April of 2018, uh, the city uh, earned $1.2 million for the first fiscal year. Um, which began our fiscal year of 1920. With um, our projections uh, of the 1920, we are projecting that our revenue earnings um, at year end for 630 are 4.9 million, and our expenditures for the budget that was approved by council at 1.8 at year end. Uh, this leaves us with about 4.3. A million for um, 2021 projects. For 2021 um, estimated measure R sales revenue to come in at 5.2 million is what we're estimating at this time. And in our projects, we do have our carryover projects that um, are not complete. We're estimating that about 2.5 million um, be completed this fiscal year coming up. And our current projects, our new projects for this fiscal year in the amount of 3.3 uh, million. This would leave us with a fund balance of 3.6 million at the end of the fiscal year. Um, 
that that's, those are some of the items that I wanted to highlight for Measure R and the projects that that are being brought to you. I would um, start with Chad to provide for details on the projects themselves. Chad. couple so Brian's gonna get most of this so the first project for me is uh, related to the existing trail rehabilitation project um, that's the one you authorized last year where we're going through and rehabilitating all the trails part of that discussion at the time part of our contract was we elected to pull out the purchase and uh, of pr um, purchasing DG for the project so we buy it ourselves and provide the contractor as needed because the projected amounts of DG was varying based off of the proposals. So we simply said it's based off cost that was proposed that we'll just do it ourselves. Um, based off of that, we think the total amount that's gonna be needed to complete the work is under $50,000 um, for the entire work. It hasn't needed as much as we thought it we would. Uh, so we're budgeting and seeking an additional 50,000 for Measure R on top of the 5,000 that, that Measure R already authorized to conduct the specific work. So this is just our portion to make sure we don't pull the needed funds from Measure R for the project from the contractor. This will cover our portion for that first year, first phase of this project, uh, which we anticipate it will probably be done by around the end of November at this pace. Uh, the contract will be done with the work. Um, and then we'll come back with you with another discussion about year two or year three as far as how we want to do a maintenance and continue maintenance on on the trail system because as you recall we only approved one year of the contract uh, to do the initial work so this is the fifty thousand we're looking for for measure r in addition to the 500 already authorized to cover the dg that the city's providing <coughs> second one i have here is for trail fencing replacement again we want to continue on with the trail fence project um, we're asking for basically double the amount that we've done in previous years. Uh, we were initially going to go for 250000 but we decided to do 500000 because uh, we're getting quite a bit done. It looks really nice out there. A lot of the work, 6th Street, um, nearly 100% finished, looks really good. Um, and we have a lot of other streets that we would like to continue on. Uh, we've reviewed those streets um, with the Streets and Trails Utilities Commission. Uh, and these are some of the streets that we are looking to um, accomplish, um, and which is Corona. Uh, uh, I won't read them off all to you, but they're there. Uh, plus a second sheet of locations. All these locations we're looking to do, um, and I have determined at this time we project that all these locations can be completed. Um, within the $500,000 funding based off of existing proposals that we've gotten in the last uh, two contracts, um, including removal of all the fencing that's out there. Because that's one of the key issues we've been hit with with the COVID-19 is we don't have any of our crews that normally we would use to try to pull the fencing, and it's a lot, lot cheaper. In this next contract, we will have in there an add alternate um, item in there for the contractors to provide removal of the fencing because uh, it's nearly 19,000 linear feet of fencing to remove. And installation, we've projected it's about 24,000 linear feet of fencing to install. But we believe we can get it all done um, with the 500,000. Ultimately, that will depend on the bids that come in. But if they're consistent what we've gotten in the past, and my estimates were a little heavy, we should be able to get all this done um, with the money if it's granted um, as Measure R has supported by the council tonight. Any questions on either of those two items? Yes, sir. Would it be possible, Chad, on the, the trail rehab to give us a, uh, like a physical update, a little map of what, where we are, what trails have been completed, where they're working presently, and what's, what's remaining? Um, I'd have to work on a map to kind of show us what they've done. Um, they're about 70% done, maybe 75, um, if my numbers recall correctly. Um, and I'm not sure where they're working. They usually have multiple crews working in different areas. So I couldn't tell you where they're working now. But we can try to work on something that kind of gives you I think a little idea map would, it, it would what just they've help. done versus yeah. what they still have to complete. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate so it. We can work on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else yeah. got anything? Uh, Chad, on your list in the trail fence replacement, and I know it's this is a sore subject. Uh, 
Hidden Valley, Norco Hills Drive. I know that's LMD2. But uh, somehow or another, the LMD2 is not going to pay for that fence. I mean, it's bottom line. But that is an entrance way into our city along Hidden Valley. And half that fence is gone. The other half is so paper thin, it should be gone in the next Santa Ana. So I, I would really like to see us look at that area. Like I said, and Brian, I'll back, there's no money there for them to replace that fence. And there's not going to be for at least 10 years. Those people up there, and now I, this is a question, so I think we need to look at that area over there because aesthetically it looks, it's bad. Thank you. I just had a question. So, they, what what's the timeline on some of the other the older streets? I mean, I, I hate to say it, Pedley between Fifth and Eighth, Hillside. Um, I mean, those are streets where the fencing was put in before Fifth to Branding Iron to Branding Iron from Pedley to Dapple Gray was even built. The fencing was put in that's there now was put in prior to that. Do we have any plans for the older streets between 5th and 6th? Honestly, the my original plan in the last couple of years in selecting locations is, is the areas where we've recently completed the street work. So we kind of get a complete street. The street's now done and clean. We've got nice new fencing. Now we're getting beyond that. We've gotten almost all the streets that have been redone. The Corona and Temescal Avenue, Corona 4th, the, 4th Street to 5th Street, Temescal Avenue 4th, Street to 5th Street and Corona from 2nd to 1st are the three remaining streets that have been repaved that don't have new fencing. After that, it's really, it's been, it's been our commission picking locations that they think um, where fencing should go. So right now it's, we can do any location you want to do. There's so much to be done. It's in, it's. Well, I, I would, I would like you to look at, and I hate to mention my street, but California, Pedley, Hillside, Temescal, um, again, all those, all that fencing was put in before those houses were built, uh, and that fencing doesn't look bad. That's why I'm, I mean, doesn't look bad. Yeah, well, Pedley, most of Pedley has been finished now, at least from the river all the way to. I'm Sykes. not even talking about Pedley. I'm talking about California. Oh, I'm sorry, Hillside. you said Pedley, so I was wondering. I said Pedley, yeah, but yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to, because I live on the street, but it would just seem there's like five streets in a row between fifth and sixth that maybe maybe the commission couldn't look at right. streets and, and trails. And California, as you know, is from 6 to north is done. Now we're looking to go the other side of California on this list. Mm -hmm. So there's two lists here, so I apologize. Yeah, and that's, go good. Back and forth. that's good. So we're trying to complete that. Um, even your, your street that you live on, Pedley, I have a, a bigger picture plan. I'd like to rehab that whole trail because it's an optimal trail uh, to engineer. Uh, I'm actually more, engineer I'm more concerned fencing. about hillside to mm -hmm. mescal those. And then my second thing is, is I would I would recommend to council that at the issues that we've we've had, we have we have to make a decision. I think as a council, are we going to, as we've done in the hills, put trees in the parkway? And in doing that, I mean, I know they're running into impediments all along the different streets. As much as we're an equestrian community, our community never had pre-planned trails; they just were invented. And basically, what happened is people like. My parents gave up all the land from, as long as there's a trail, they owned all the land to the middle of the street. Once the trails happened, then that was sort of taken away. Um, so are we going to have trees as they are now in the right-of-way, which actually, when most of the trees were planted, that was the people's property? Or are we going to erase all of those and put it in the parkway? And I think that's a decision we have to make as a council. Um, and I think we need to do it lickety split because we're doing trails right now. And I think we need to decide in 10 years down the line, where are the trees going to go? Are we going to have people plant them just on their property and then have them, then we go through? Because I don't see how financially or just width of a street, how we're ever going to be able to plant a bunch of trees in the parkway. I just don't see it. I also, as I look it up in the hills where they're in the parkway, a lot of those are very invasive roots. Eventually, it's going to start cracking the concrete. Do we want to pre-plan that in the flatlands. So I think 
I recommend we have a council meeting where we talk about what exactly you're dealing with because you're, I mean, the trails look beautiful. The one in front of my house is A1. But, uh, but I had to move everything back. And, and I did it to set an example. Good job. Thank you very much. It almost killed me. I'm an old man. But the, my point is, is I think we need to have a meeting and decide because it's going to help you. And then we begin to find out what residents want because there's people already, as you know, that are upset that they're, I mean, some of the things are pretty dubious, but there's some people that, like on my street, that if you start cutting that stuff away, it's going to be a big deal. So I just think we need to make a decision. Where are we going to put the trees eventually? Yeah, to that, uh, to that question, one of the things we plan to do once the maintenance, first year of the maintenance contract is done, is come back to you and talk about that very issue of encroachments and trees. Right now, we're not taking things out that are not that are more hardened and physical. If there's low-lying grass, something we, we will move that to clean up the trail. But most items that are impediments, we are documenting so that we come back to you and give you the daunting list of just how many encroachments and impediments we have, which is the trees, which is hydrants, um, telephone pole, it's everything. But it, I mean, right now we're focusing on the, the physical encroachments that have narrowed our trails to have that discussion about how you want me to address that, because obviously you know that's going to be a big discussion amongst this community. And it's something because I'm sure Robin remembers yeah. before the the Lurpacillus, all the the, and before all the pepper trees started to die, and Edison cut them off. And I'm sure you remember too. I mean, Norco had a beautiful urban forest, and just it's aged out and that kind of stuff. So, do we want to try to replicate that, or are we going to do something totally different? I don't know. Right. Anyway, I just think that the sooner we have that discussion, the better. Robin, do you have anything? Okay, uh, I guess we need a motion. This is Brian's. Now, Brian's going to go through his projects. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <coughs> Good evening. Uh, this first project is the next parking lot allotment that we're doing. Uh, Animal Control, Parmenter Park, and Wayne May Macon, we've evaluated these parking lots. They're next on our list for improvements. Um, and uh, we would be, uh, based on this uh, um, and the engineer's evaluations, this is what he came back with for us for rehabilitation of these particular uh, three different parking lots. Uh, Riley Gym Improvements, uh, we've, we've added a new floor to the gymnasium. We have a new roof on the gymnasium. Uh, the next steps uh, would be to deal with the installation, which has been an issue, and we would actually bring and have an engineer coming in. We've actually have uh, actually uh, had discussions with two different engineers related to mechanical to try and come up with a better solution that's uh, cost effective uh, in regards to what we have existing right now. And so part of that would be redoing the installation in, gym, in the gymnasium, uh, interior renovations, which would include uh, painting and, uh, and uh, fixing our backboards, our curtain, uh, then also adding security uh, and our smoke detection system within the gymnasium, updating that. And then painting uh, is part of that. Uh, and then an interior uh, sign. Uh, pool demolition, the, the pool itself um, is an attractive nuisance. It is becoming a, uh, a problem for us, uh, both uh, not only from uh, our department, uh, cutting of the fence, uh, uh, items going on that are people uh, partying, breaking bottles in there, uh, doing all kinds of uh, illegal activity, but most recently uh, we've had groups in there from all the way from Los Angeles in there trying to excuse it as a skate facility and uh, the sheriffs had to or having to assist us in running people out of there. Uh, the pool at this point cannot be rehabilitated. Uh, it, it would not meet any type of codes to be able to do that. Uh, at this point, we are recommending that it be de demolished uh, and removed from the site. Mm. Tennis court next to it, too. 
Uh, it does not. Um, the tennis court, as you know, it is in bad shape. It probably should be replaced as well. Uh, the following fiscal year, uh, we've talked uh, with uh, our, our commission, we've talked about looking at possibly looking at the community center as a whole and its amenities. We've looked at the community center. I've even uh, maybe addressing some of the issues that the uh, historical society has, looking at an additional wing. We've looked at how can we, uh, maybe in this area where we demo, we could maybe have a splash pad, maybe put in outdoor basketball courts, things that would have a good use next to the gymnasium, which has over 85,000 people annually uh, attending it So for activities. So we feel that there's some things that could be done more of a master plan process related to the community center, and that's something we would look at in the following fiscal year. Um, the event center pole barns, I'm going to skip this because I want to come back and I want to show you some other slides. But in our request here, we came up with about 1.6, almost $1.1 million for replacement of the pole barns. The pole barns have, um, what are basically on their last stages uh, um, and we're at a point where they are deteriorating to the point where they're going to be condemned and torn down regardless of whatever we do, that, that it, we're approaching that. The poles have, uh, a lot of that was built in the very early 70s. Uh, a lot of it was from materials uh, that have been around for a long time. It's just no longer feasible uh, to keep them in the, the way they are. So we've been working very closely with our FFA 4-H groups, our staff, uh, our subcommittees, to talk about what we need to do there. We've come up with a footprint uh, for uh, replacement of the pool barns that also uh, create uh, additional uses. So it's not just for animal exhibitions and activities, but also provides for potential rentals or expansion of community uh, use within that those pool barns. Um, Pretty much what we've identified in here is how we arrived at the $1.1 uh, $1 million almost. And uh, this would also, in that area, would include the additions of restrooms and storage. So, um, and to do this site, uh, we would be having to run new sewer and storm drain uh, into this site to uh, collect water. Runoff, also we would have to have built in uh, particularly on the animal keeping, we're going to have to co have collectors uh, that, and clarifiers to before anything gets washed off or goes into storm drain. That's going to that is a requirement. Also, uh, we'll have to run lines. The clear, nearest storm drain, or I'm sorry, uh, sewer for us is in the major service road that runs between uh, the upper arenas and uh, animal control there down that major service road. That is the closest sewer line to this location. I do have a little um, site map that I want to show you. Let me get through it and then I'll come to that uh, particular slide for you guys just to show you what we've been conceptually talking about. Uh, Nellie Weaver Hall improvements, this includes also our insulation issue there. Uh, it is made up of this sort of the similar same insulation that was in uh, uh, Riley Jim, which is a paper insulation, you, you can't even do that anymore. So we would be looking again, uh, consulting and doing some sort of a batten in between uh, the rafters is what we feel would be the most effective and most cost effective type of insulation. Uh, replacing of the stage door, electrical pedestals in the front. Um, at one time, that was where the fair had, and that's why those were there. The fair is all upstairs. Right now, it is a problem when we have events or activities or community activities at Nellie Weaver Hall, the pedestals are in the way. In fact, um, they it's pretty common that someone hits them and knocks them over and we got to stand them back up. So really cleaning that up and really making a real viable parking area with handicap is part of that process and also would be part of the parking lot and drainage that we've identified in that. And so giving it really kind of a refresh from the outside, repainting the facility, uh, removing some of our dry rot that we have and termite uh, problems that we've had where in some of our wood areas we've actually lost uh, some of the uh, integrity of the wood we would be replacing that 
and that would be part of this particular project here. Then uh, Marino Arena Sound System, we're uh, over 20 years old in that sound system. That sound system needs a refreshing. Uh, so we want to work with our subcommittee to actually look at engineering and replacing that sound system. At this point in time, some of our existing rack equipment, I think, is all viable and user could be reused, but there are certain uh, elements of our speakers. The technology that we want to go is night and day from when we first originally put those in. So I really think we can put a more effective system in there than what we actually have right now, which has its problems and has pretty much lived its life expectancy. Ball field sports lighting, during the winds, and the reason why it doesn't even come back sooner is those facilities have been shut down and I took the poles out. But we've had three poles fall down. Uh, during wind. So I had poles inspected throughout the city for their integrity um, when they were actually put in and this. So basically we're in pretty good shape based on that evaluation. However, uh, these three poles are, um, are gone. The issue at this site, which is Clark and Community Center, is that we're going to be bringing kids back to play and practice at some point. Uh, lights are going to be a needed resource and currently right now the way it stands I can't light those fields properly uh, to be able to uh, have kids go out there and play. So this would be the replacement of three of our poles. Those would go into, we would actually be adding LED. We just did a survey for that. Uh, this would actually give us uh, coming in up, upcoming fiscal years to do a program where we start replacing all of the old fixtures and going LED everywhere. Uh, sports lighting and LED has come so far. This would actually be a, a, good, a good infrastructure item for us, plus it would save money in the long run. This is a, uh, a summary of the various projects that uh, I've outlined tonight. And Matt, can you show that other slide for me real quick? So the pool barn project, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update at it. Uh, basically, when we, had, when we started meeting with uh, our, our community, uh, some of the groups that use it, our staff, um, you know, this facility, if it was uh, uh, replaced, we're looking at one large facility. It allows us, as opposed to three different facilities, it allows us to be able to attract junior livestock, 4-H youth, provide multi-purpose facility for community and private events to host educational opportunities which focus on youth and agriculture. It's a showcase facility for community events, i.e. the fair. It also provides, based on what we're looking at in design, to allow us to be able to do anything from a dog show to a wedding, outdoor wedding reception, uh, wedding, uh, to the reception at Nellie Weaver Hall. So it brings the connection there. It gives us ability to do several different things that would be more conducive to uh, to what we need today versus the facility that was built, you know, 40 plus years ago. The facility provides for the uh, protection of animals from the elements and other dangers in the facility that we are looking at to, to build. It provides for emergency small livestock housing during emergency conditions for evacuation. Uh, the new facility will add a gorgeous visual interest to the property and provide a venue to generate additional revenue. I, I, I really believe it also, the way we're looking at this, is build something that stays within our character of our community as well. Um, we're looking at a, a steel construction, a concrete floor, uh, it would have electrical, it would have drainage, it would have a lot of amenities that would be, allow us to have activities, exhibits, and uh, uh, bring in other events and venues throughout the year. Uh, discussions have been also related to the wind that we get, the sun, and how it rises and how it sets to the facility. So our groups have been talking about that. Do we do siding? Do we do some sort of uh, 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 type of screens that come down? So all of those are part of the discussion. Right now, we need to move forward with design. If I was to be ready for the fair next year, um, 
we need to get the design completed, get it out, get it to bid, so that I could be in construction by the end of the year. This is one of our top projects to do, just because I can't tell you if the barns will be here next year anyway, based on the conditions of the, the, the existing conditions of them. So this is a site plan of the whole facility. It kind of gives you an, a perspective here. Uh, this is to the north and this is to the south. Uh, I'm trying to find it, but I think it's right about right here, where here is our sewer manhole. Our sewer runs all the way up here. Uh, we run laterals here and back to here to that main. So if we were to build restrooms, which is what we're talking about in storage facilities for all of the equipment, uh, the sewer lines would have to run back here, all the way this way. Uh, there is no sewer lines in 6th Street. Uh, but what we're looking at is approximately 15,000 square feet or a little more, and that would incorporate the actual exhibition site, um, not to include the restrooms and uh, storage facilities. It would be redoing this whole site, creating a venue that also would be conducive for the various events we would like to bring in and attract in a, in a pole barn type situation. Um, this is, we've already completed area topo on the site, so we've already have managed the engineering to the site. So the next steps for us and working with this and our different groups and the community is to really get into the design, get this out. We're looking at the option of a design build type feature on this, uh, which would be very acceptable to these sort of prefabricated type of facilities. Um, there is a lot of site work that would be done civil work, so that would be included in our estimating. This is just a picture of an example of how, in it, how it could be set up if you had sidewalls, what you could do with openings and various things. So those are all, this is all part of the discussion. Um, right now, because of costs, we're not sure that walls would be, but we would want to do something on the sides to reduce one wind and reduce uh, the potential of uh, the where the sun rises and the sun sets at this site. We'd also be looking at the landscaping in this whole area of redoing that to make it more attractive. Uh, and just kind of the, the idea and concept that we've been looking at is the Montier or the type of barn, this type of barn. One, we think from a construction standpoint, we can meet our needs, but yet also be cost effective in that. And I gave you this picture only because it's the what if. You can facade things, you can give a different feel and a look that makes it be very opening to be able to offer a reception. We have done some outdoor weddings up there. It's very challenging with uh, not a solid floor. Um, it does make it more attractive when you put a solid floor in. It does allow us to be able to do a lot of different things uh, to the facility, uh, including some of our agility dog shows would be able to compete in that size facility. And we've actually have talked to our dog show people who have said most certainly they would rent the facility. Uh, and, and that concludes my presentation. Um, and, and conceptually, don't get hooked into what I am because I still gotta go back and work to, with the committee. The key for me is to get this project moving get uh, RKA on board to get into design because we need to get moving on this if we would like to have this built. Uh, and my objective would be uh, have an opening uh, by August of 2021. So with that, I'll conclude the projects and answer any questions. So, Matt, Brian, you can go back to the original C, uh, Measure R uh, slide. Brian. Uh-huh. Uh, how big did you say that pole barn was going to be? Right now, we'd be looking at at least 15,000 square feet. Okay, how big are the ones that are up there? Total, right now, we're a little total. bit... The footprint is almost the same if you count the gaps in between. So in between each barn you have existing, you have a dirt space in between. Right. So if you looked at that whole footprint, you'd come up with almost 15,000 to closer to 20,000 square feet. But we'd get rid of all that mess and just have one building up there? One building, yes, sir. Okay. And that building would be designed so that we are able to attract various activities, uh, uh, 
our facility supervisor has been engaged in the process of what, what do you need to use this on weekends and things that when there's nothing going on. And so that's been part of our discussion, you know, w bringing power and being able to drop power out of the ceiling versus drying a draw, run extension cords everywhere, drainage. Having the ability when we put in, uh, if we have a livestock exhibition, let's say we have pigs, we can't have, we, being able to have sleeves in the ground where we can set up our, our pens uh, and, and be able to station her so the pigs don't move them around. Being able to come up with a design that allows us the flexibility of creating an exhibition facility, but then turn around and let it have the ability that you could have uh, an outdoor wedding or a reception in there or a public meeting providing outdoor and airflow. That's, that's why you'd need a solid floor in yes, there sir. then. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Ted? Uh, but <clears throat> on the pole barns, I like the concept, just just so you know. But take a look at Lancaster, the uh, Antelope Valley Fairgrounds, the uh, Van Dam building, beautiful setup like that. And then Industry Hills with your when you're out, your facade out front. Yeah. Industry Hills, you look in the front, it's a cool facade, and you go in the back, <laughs> it's a tent, but you, it looks good. Okay. Anyway. No, those are uh, good things, and we can just, most certainly But do. my question to you on the Nellie Weaver Hall improvements, mm -hmm. are there any improvements for lights in that parking lot, Brian? You're, you're fixing the parking lot, the lights are terrible. Yeah. Part, part of this is we have some money in there for an assessment, so we're going to look at both the inside and the outside in that. Uh, but when I'm doing the redoing the electrical, that can be part of the process. Okay. I, I agree with you. We only have two floodlights out there. You're right. It's not adequate. It's bad. And, well, if you're going to improve the parking lot, maybe the lights won't be bad because you won't trip over anything. Part, part of this money is also we would be basically removing all old electrical in that area and we put putting all new backbone. Yeah. That would be the perfect time to add certain lights. Well, when you go in there because I was over there the other day. Um, by the way, for those who don't know, we no longer have a jail there. It, uh, the termites decided to move it. <laughs> anyway, uh, the sound booth uh, for the old Ted Naramore uh, auditorium bleachers there. I don't know what you call it now. The mm -hmm. amphitheater in the back. You might want to look at that. I about fell to the floor of the sound booth. And the electrical and Greg you get a kick out of this if you went back there in the back with the electrical and the sound booth goes back and goes to the floor for their junction box somebody put a fish fishing tackle a plastic fishing tackle box this is the cover that's where all the cables go into so the thing hasn't been used in years but y'all yeah you need to look at it okay so, okay if you're going to be in there we'll make that part of our electrical assessment thank you okay <clears throat> I have a couple basic questions. So, staff advises Measure R that comes to council. I'm wondering at some point if we can go council to staff to Measure R. And the reason I say that is that one of the things for me that's missing from all of this is there's no economic development really at all. It's all public improvements. I like them all. I do have considerations. But I'm not seeing any public, I'm seeing public improvement, which is important. But given the obstacles we're experiencing now and the things that I anticipate we will be experiencing, I have concerns that we're not looking realistically at what we're about to face as a state and a city. I'm really concerned. I know we kind of joke about it, but I, I realize we've got to put money into, to, uh, Riley Jim, and a lot of those things, I was on the commission when we approved them, but I still feel like what we should have done is we should have seriously looked at that corner and redone it. I think that that gym is old. I think now we're talking about fixing the scout house. I think we could have consolidated something and we probably, I believe we could have found the funding maybe to do it. Looks like we've gone past that. But that is a corner in which, let's face it, we have, as you've said, Brian, we have 85,000 people a year that go into that building. That's correct. And we capture no money. We can only charge what the program costs. 
we're now going to put three million dollars and do only what the going rate will allow us to charge. That's a lot of friggin' money. One of the things that, um, if I approve the pole barns, which I totally love, but right now they're used four weeks a year, and that's it. We have no means whatsoever to really capture putting something into them. So what I would, what I really think needs to happen is, we need to understand that we need to help our current person that's booking that. We need to hire somebody because we're being irresponsible spending over a million dollars on pole barns for three and a half, four weeks. If we don't put into place at the same time the means to bring in the weddings, to bring in all those things, and I think we can do it, but I think we're going to have to hire somebody. Otherwise, a million dollars for three and a half weeks? Well, so, so I just think, Brian, and I'm going to support it, but I want to see a staffer that I want to see that sucker book six, seven, eight, nine months out of a year. The, the key to what we're trying to do as a group is design it so it's not three or four weeks. I, I, t I get it, but and, as we've discussed, we but, need to have a staff. But I would not disagree with you to really lift it to that level is something that we need to have as that process as we go into next year's budget workshops. And I just, I just feel that the, the next group of stuff I see, I want to see economic development. And and uh, I, I and I totally get. You no, know, the pool has to go. I totally get all that stuff, but not one thing on this list is going to generate. It'll generate public pride. It'll generate use for the public. It'll do all those things, but ultimately, we need to be developing, continuing developing a diversified income stream to protect our city's economy and our lifestyle. Um, I intend to support all these things. But Andy, we've got to have some staffers to book this stuff. And, uh, and again, I believe we are totally missing an opportunity surrounding the community center. I think, I think it's a, I'm going to support it, but it's a mistake to be putting money into that gym. We should have stopped that two years ago. And we just should have built a new gym, a bigger one in which we could have figured out a, a master plan for the entire community center. And I just really, it really bothers me that we just didn't do that. So again, I'm going to support all of it. I think it's important. But <coughs> by January, February, I want to see a plan for how we're going to utilize this This other than, and, and trust me, there's nobody more support behind, nor supportive of the FFA. But for a building that essentially can sit empty, I really want to see, find a plan for making use of it. And Brian, you're the guy I know that can do it, okay? That's all I have to say, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. I'd just like to comment on the economic side of it and at the community center. I don't disagree that footprint in there, but that was one of the comments and discussions is that perhaps in the following year, we need to, remember, we didn't have any money until last year to even do anything. And so a lot of our money has been spent on trying to rehabilitate and bring certain elements just that were broken fit to fix them. If we're going to look at the community center, Kevin, I think you can master plan that. You can talk about all of the various functionalities and how can you make that Hamner forefront right there, make it more user friendly. And I think that's something in this next uh, fiscal year process that we look at, how do we look at that whole corner, what can that be using existing facilities, dressing existing facilities up? That's part of master plan, and that's probably, if we're going to do it, then that's the way we should look at those type of plans. Yeah, and I think in the future, and I don't know why this happened, I think that it needs to go from council to staff to measure R. And I think the reason we did that, comment on that. yeah, yeah. And that is the way it's intended to operate. The process we have now, I believe, works. If city council, any one of members of the city council can provide uh, to staff in terms of uh, projects we need to look at. And uh, we'll put that an assessment process in that. Um, and. Uh, to the measure our citizens of um, we work together and uh, I think 
the development part goes through staff and then COC reviews this, this project in their capacity as, as intended and then uh, we are ready to bring it back to the city council. Uh, it doesn't stop you as a city council even as we sit here today to see that this is additional projects we want you to go take a look at and yeah. we can go back take a look at it process and uh, yeah, and I totally understand that, and I, I sit there and I look at a, uh, a Hamner Avenue front, and I've mentioned it now almost three and a half years. I've been saying, I said, that gymnasium, I know it well, is falling apart. And I just felt that we should have really addressed that. Now we've put so much money into it, we can't move forward. Realistically, we're looking at Ingalls Park. It is an enclosed facility. It's not a facility that the public can go to or come back and forth to, whereas there's other places in the city where people come and go. And just in terms of economic viability, it would just seem to me, I would just, I'm, and I'm not criticizing anyone. These are all, these are fabulous projects. I mean, what sold me, Brian, was when I saw the picture. I went, whoa, that could be really cool. But I want to make sure that it's not sitting empty, that's all. So that it, it is useful to the public that we are able to do certain things with it. But we have been and sat with councils that didn't get, they had to make money. And we almost went bankrupt because we had one funding source. And I think we just need to, if I can, suggest that we need to consider expanding as many funding sources to the city of Norco as possible. And um, that's, that's it's pretty, it's, it's simple, as simple as that. So thank you very much. I don't want to go on and on. Robin? <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, I'll go ahead and speak to um, a couple of things. The first one is uh, the pole barns. When we talk about the pole barns and economic development, um, I think they go together. Um, when we were pre-COVID, uh, staff had um, events going on up at Ingalls Park um, very, very consistently. The fact is like a dog show, for example, it's a very specific footprint that they need. And those dog shows are pretty large uh, when they come uh, to town. And so a couple of things, number one, the facility, if it goes as designed, could be dog shows, trade shows, large banquets, and we're talking about facilities that are not available regionally, and that is going to bring people in um, to our area. So it's not about four weeks. I kind of have the feeling if you build it, they will come because it's gonna be the only thing like it in the area, and there are groups that if you wanna have a nice sit-down banquet, that exceeds 100 people, you're out of luck in this area. And so this can potentially meet that need. When we look at some of the extended events like livestock shows and things like that, and even the single day things, you're looking at restaurants being frequented, hotels being stayed at. So I would argue that if this is done correctly, and I know it will be, that it is going to be a revenue generator. Is it gonna take the whole event center and bring it up out of, you know, where it's operating at now? No. Does it have the potential to at some point in time? Yes. The other thing I would bring up about as far as the economic development and the use of facilities is we have an event center that essentially has two arenas, the Barnes, Nellie Weaver Hall, all of the Veterans um, Memorial. If we were in the private sector, that would be four different people booking those four different places, and we have one person doing all the booking. So I think we need to look at it, you know, with the fact that you have one person working their tail off to keep an event center running and booked and working. Nellie Weaver Hall, pre-COVID, if you wanted it for a weekend, it was highly likely you wouldn't be able to get it because it's booked. So, you know, I think making investments that are, yes, public improvements and are going to make our community proud are very important, but they're, they're revenue generators as well, maybe not for 
you know, us directly, but definitely for our restaurants, our hotels, all of those different things. And, and yeah, it's a lot of money because things have been neglected. Nothing's been done in that specific area since when it was built in the 70s and any small repairs or anything that's been done has been done by the groups that use that area period and so yeah it's a big chunk of change right now but that's our fault for letting it sit for that long with no maintenance or or replacement or anything else so i think it's an i know it's an important project and it's not just because, you know, people say, well, Robin, you run the livestock show and there's one week of the year that it's used. Absolutely. I live up there for that seven days or whatever it is. But again, when we look at the big picture, and again, I go back to we have one person booking, but I can foresee in the future once all the COVID stuff is, you have two arenas running, you have a barn running, you have Nellie Weaver Hall running, and it's going to be crazy busy in a fully operating event center that all of those people are going to be at our restaurants those people are going to be staying at our hotels and it again i just see potential once we get beyond where we're at now and all the improvements are made and the facilities are are to a level that they need to be and there's the potential for it to be a showcase in the inland empire and people to come here and be here and it's the place where people will want to have their events so i'm super excited about what you have planned and um i think it has a ton of potential and uh, thank you for bringing them forward respond I, I i absolutely agree with her i absolutely agree with you but as our discussion was we don't have what we're going to need tandem with this as a staff and i think we as a council need to absolutely plan for that so that when this opens we have more than just one person doing the booking and i think that's really really important if we're going to capture that right out of the gate um, otherwise i mean i think it's i think it's a great project i i absolutely agree with you i just want to make sure because right now you can't do any of that you can build that and you don't have the people to book any of it and what needs to happen is we're going to have to we're going to have to hire somebody to help to facilitate all that probably bring in a professional somebody to help patty who works her butt off so you and i are totally we're totally in agreement robin we just need more people over there Greg. thank you mayor um overall i approve most of these uh, uh, with these projects Kevin I do agree with you on your earlier comments about uh, the community center uh, I think early on I had made some comments when we were talking about uh, you know redoing the flooring and redoing the roofing and uh, but that was not the direction we chose to take at that time um, but kind of bringing this all back this is all measure R so I think my my gut feeling is you know the residents passed measure R streets and trails number one that's what they wanted to see get the trails dialed in let's get streets repaired and Chad's been making good progress on that and then after that was building infrastructure um, and, and so we're starting to make some gains in that area but I I, I guess we hear common about economic development. All, all of these do have a economic impact ever so slightly. And, and just taking a small one like, say, a Marino Arena, hell, it took us 15 years just to get paint on the steel. Um, we, we just were great at ignoring things, okay? And so then I look at the sound system that at that same time that was hal clark and mike montgomery stringing wire up in that steel trying to get it ready for horse week um 18 19 years ago so i don't think you can attract decent events unless you spend the money let's say on a sound system so there's some there's an economic driver there it's just a smaller component so i mean i'm I'm agreeing with what you're saying, but I, I think all of these do have an economic benefit. That's all I have to say, Mayor. I've well, a lot of those of people got to where they brought their own sound system. Yeah. 
you know, because I, when they first put that in there, and you remember, Brian, I came to council and accused you guys of spending $99 at Radio Shack for the sound <laughs> system. Yep. And that's just that's just about what it sounded like. But I see because they strung the wire up there, and they, they did it in a, a big hurry to get horse wheat going. It didn't even have a fence around there. Right. You know, they had to bring in fences and stuff. But no, I'm glad to see you're improving that and uh, everything. So we look for a motion here. For I have one more, you know, one more thing. And, and if there's any, but Brian, and I'm looking at your, your list. I'm going to pick on you because you already know I'm going to do this. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, you, you look at your carryover projects. And the, one of the things that, and this came from some trail riders and people that are all the time down there, and they asked me about it, the causeway. Mm -hmm. We about got some nice trails situated, and I know there's some trail riders that have been working with Todd and gone through. They showed him how he had to fix the trail. But that causeway is a stumbling block, and we need to unstumble it. Just it basically, we, we set aside that money last year. It's still sitting there. I know the pole barns are priority. Got guaranteed that because right. of time. But we got to quit pushing that other one back. Yeah, and we've got preliminary design. We're going to have to now take that and get into the final construction documents. This particular project will also require us to uh, have a discussion with JCSD and regarding an MOU between the two properties as well, uh, and perhaps Silver Lakes as the same well, as all part a three-party situation there, for us to really make the full connection of the trail. Okay, uh, and then the other thing back to the park. Uh, if you haven't been up there lately, because I have, because without court workers, uh, there's a few as, that are the FTVs of the city, uh, and I'll explain to you sometime, but take a look at what Todd has done and his crews have done up there without events, the improvements. Uh, I think you'll be surprised. You drive in there, yes, it's grinding, and thank you very much, but it's smooth. You're not going to rattle your your trailer driving in there now, at least through the gate one. Um, the drains are in. We don't have to worry about the water flooding Marina, uh, Marina Arena because they finally put drains in. So things are happening. And so this is, yeah, Kevin, you talk about the infrastructure and that and, and the uh, economic development. Uh, I've seen Patty's List. Patty's List before COVID was done two years ahead of time for that park. And everything, Ingle, to include Nellie Weaver, to include, and you talk about economic drivers, when these dog shows are not, and dog shows are so easy for us. It's a good money maker. They're coming from Long Beach and out of LA because they don't have that facility. And they're coming out here in their motorhomes, they're parking out here, and they're staying over the weekend. They're using, they're coming out stores. So they're there. Um, and Patty has always said if she had a place to put them, right now they're at Pikes Peak Park in the grass. And when a wind blows, they can't be in there. Uh, they moved into Merino, and that's an easy thing. Two-day dog show going into Clark. Uh, so, but if you look at what's been going on up there, Brian and his staff have really been doing a good job. And, and so these things are going to take time and uh, the improvements. So, but I just, I got to pick on you on the causeway because that needs to get done. That's our other part that we owe our residents is to get those trails opened up. Thank you. You know, I'll make a motion, but in just a second, you know, don't get me wrong. Part of the reason improvements didn't happen, I, I, I started out as a park and rec commissioner in 1997 when we had no money, nothing. And I'm well aware of the things that need to be done there. I'm delighted that we have the money. I just want to make sure that we, and you make a very good point in that Measure R is for public improvements. That's a good point. I just want to make sure that when we run this thing, I, I'd like to make sure we have staff that can really do it. Patty does a great job, and I would totally support, you know, having one other person there to assist her. I think that would really be helpful. Um, so I make a motion that we approve everything as uh, presented by staff. I'll second. <clears throat> we had.
had no public comment on this item tonight. Okay. Got to ask. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilmember Grunmeyer? Yes. <clears throat> Councilmember Hoffman? Yes. Councilmember Newton? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash? Yes. Mayor Hanna? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Okay, item seven is public hearings. First one is staff presentation. Council questions of staff, open the public hearing. Public speakers in favor or against are neutral. Close the public hearing. Council discussion and action. So item A is uh, confirming the report of cost for abatement of weeds and hazardous vegetation as a public nuisance and imposing special assessment liens on vacant parcels within the city. The battalion chief, uh, uh, yes, you're going to be the battalion chief mayor, tonight, yes, Andy? Uh, yes. uh, well, the fire chief is on vacation this week, so I get to do a brief uh, staff report on this. Uh, as you uh, pointed out, this is uh, an item for the city council to confirm the cost of doing the abatement uh, for uh, spring weeds. Um, the process starts by uh, the fire department notifying property owners of the need for them to abate weeds on their vacant parcel, <coughs> and uh, those notices were mailed out on March uh, 2nd, 2020. Uh, property owners had until uh, April 5th to comply, and then on April 6th, 6th inspections began, and the lots that failed those inspections uh, were, uh, first of all, uh, received a $250 um, administrative citation, and then subsequent to that, uh, the, uh, the fire department uses uh, their contractor uh, to go ahead and abate the weed and uh, the cost of abating those weeds uh, have been outlined in the schedule that is attached to the staff report and in addition to the act the cost of abating the weeds uh, the city also adds uh, the same amount as administrative administrative fee uh, for those uh, uh, property owners. Um, after you take this act action tonight, uh, the invoices will be mailed out to the property owners. And for those property owners that failed to pay for the invoices, um, those invoices will become a lien on their property. Um, total of 18 parcels that failed inspection, uh, four property owners were able to do the uh, abatement on their own prior to the deadline and the uh, um, uh, contractor had to go out and do abatement on 14 uh, parcels. Uh, uh, one thing I do want to point out that except for one property owner, all the other owners of the remaining 13 parcels are out of town uh, property owners. Mm -hmm. Asking for your approval to go ahead and, and mail out the invoices to this Questions, comments? Have any uh, public? Or did you have a hand up, Greg? No. Oh, have any cards? Comments? We have no public comments. Okay, then we'll uh, we'll close the public hearing and uh, bring it back. Does anybody want to make a motion? Second. Councilmember Grummeyer. Yes. Councilmember Huffman. Yes. Councilmember Newton, yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bash, yes. Mayor Hanna. Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Thank you. Okay, uh, item eight, City Council, City Manager, Staff Communications. Kevin, we'll start with you first. Yeah, I just had a, a, a very quick thing. I'm hoping I can't remember, Brian. What was it? We were going to have a discussion on Norco Hills Road. Were we going to wait until we began to do the the process of? seeing if they'll vote in a tax increase, or are we going to discuss that first? Um, what Councilman Bash is talking about is it's something that's been in the discussion, which is uh, our issue concerning right now, we don't have crews citywide related to weeds. And we may have to look at coming back to the council and coming up with a plan where we're contracting out under our existing contracts to remove 
this vegetation or these weeds. On Norco Hills Road. On Norco Hills Road, it's a little different because that's in an assessment district. Right. The assessment does not have the the funding to do so. Right. In our recent inspection with the fire chief, he has told us that the that vegetation that is now dyed needs to be uh, modified, meaning that it can stay, but it has to be modified, meaning that it has to be cut down to no more than six to eight inches. And we need to, f or it needs to be removed. So there's two ways that has to happen. Either we're going to pay for that out of the general fund, uh, because if we go to, if we were to take it from the assessment, we would have to cut somewhere within the assessment to balance that budget at the end, because the assessment yeah. doesn't have the funds for it. It just looks so bad. When when does the uh, voting for the assessment come up? Well, typically that's done would be done in 2021 if it was to come back. Yeah. Well, I wish we'd somehow look at that because when you drive in, it looks really bad. And I, the discussion, though, on District 2 and when we met before on it remember. was is that the residents need to come back and say, we want to do this. It wasn't going to be a staff-driven review of the assessment and increases again. Um, of course, that was back then. Now it might be different. The problem is, is that everything we said that would happen uh, is starting to happen. The parkway is going bad. Those trees are going to die in that parkway, and that slope is dying off. Right. Yeah, it just looks bad. And then, uh, Chad, thank you very much. You, I've got how many emails have I gotten on 12,000 different things, and you've been stellar in all of them. I do have one thing that I'd like you to look into is this uh, recycling fee, uh, the asphalt. There is no place to take it. That's why everybody just sort of there's no there's not a place in Riverside County, and there's very few in the entire state of California where you take uh, asphalt roofing to a recycling place so you can get the $250 back. So if at least that's what I can find, and of course what the what the um, resident is saying, and I can't find I can't even find one uh, outside of 100 miles away. Do you think you might be able to find a recycling center where that stuff can be taken so that we can let residents residents know otherwise the idea that the $250 that they would get back if they recycle it there's no way to get it back is, is it and if we can't find something then maybe we need to look at that and I don't know I don't know what you do about it but at least what I can find we just can't find one so that's all I have mr. mayor thank you very much thank you mr. mayor uh, <clears throat> Kevin touched on it, so I don't want to go too far, but <clears throat> the parkway along uh, Hidden Valley, and I mentioned Arco Hills, Brian had talked about it. We essentially, on LMD2, we shut the water off. Um, if you drive down Norco Hills Road and, and uh, the Hidden Valley, it looks bad. We need to turn the water back on. We're going to lose trees. It's going to cost us more to replace those trees in that parkway. And I, I'm to the point where we had a car fire up there on Hidden Valley, on Norco Hills, or no, it was on Hidden Valley. Right there, the, no, it's Norco Hills Road. There was a fire out there. It caught the fence on the side, and it could have got up into that acacia. That acacia is nothing but a, um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, it's it's there. It's it's a fire hazard. I clear it off or whatever we do with acacia, but if we don't start watering those trees, that's on us. And, I'll, and I've already said earlier how I feel about the fence along, the trail fence along Hidden Valley. It's pathetic, and it's not a very good welcoming atmosphere when you drive into our town. So. Uh, that's where I'm going. If we can look into that, maybe if for future, see what that cost has. I know Chad will tell me the meter's going to cost us a fortune. The water won't. But we got to water those trees. This is silly. Thank you. John? Andy? Yep. Matt? Sam? Yep. Steve? Ted? Brian? Okay, yeah, I do. <laughs> An update that everybody's been waiting for. Uh, August 3rd, uh, 
the governor's office through the California Department of Public Health issued a guideline for youth sports. So youth sports effective August 3rd can resume. However, there are a lot of caveats to that. So it, and there's some reflecting guidelines that go back to the CDC as well. Um, uh, but effectively, uh, we will be working with our youth council uh, on when they can come back and how they will come back and a plan has to be developed to make sure that they understand all the guidelines and rules that are in there. Competition as we would know uh, cannot be, cannot happen. Uh, scrimmages cannot happen. Conditioning, skill development, uh, agility, those things can all be done uh, under the guidelines uh, as long as social distancing and the CDC guidelines are adhered to. Uh, sports as a whole um, can participate under those guidelines. Um, professional, semi-professional, uh, and high school sports are still a different case. Uh, CIF came out, I believe, December going into January. They will start to bring back high school sports if everything um, falls in line. Uh, if we move into stage, we're at stage two right now, or what they call accelerated stage two. If that was to move to stage three, certain things will be lifted if we move into stage four. We are one, one of the problems with the way the language is is that we are also under a watch this county is. So our guidelines are look, could be a little bit more restrictive than say San Bernardino County or Orange County. So when you see someone else doing something that might be that might be some of the reasons. Either that or they're just doing it because they just said the heck with it and they're going to do it. But we are trying to adhere to the guidelines. Our day camps may be affected by that. I have a correspondence into county council related to this to get clarification on a couple things and then we will be releasing the message out uh, to the whole community as as well as to our youth sports groups. So I just want to give you an update related to the latest on the uh, pandemic and coronavirus. Dana? Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to remind the community that we have had two unscheduled vacancies for our on commissions for our historic preservation. We do have one unscheduled vacancy. The term will be through 2021 and the planning commission. We have a vacancy with a term um, that would go through 2022. We are in open recruitment now and we ask the community to please get involved and submit their applications. You can go online to our website and under recruitment, you can find the application and turn that into electronic to City Hall or bring it in yourself. Um, and I look forward to people participating in that. Also, um, we are right in the middle of our um, election nomination period. We currently have eight potential candidates, four have qualified. I'm waiting for three to file their final papers. One um, has filed and I'm waiting for the approval on their qualification. Um, with an incumbent not submitting their um, candidacy, it, as of 6 p.m. tomorrow, when the nomination officially closes, it will reopen to non-incumbents, extend to next Wednesday, um, August 12th. So the community will have another additional um, almost seven days to apply for candidacy when an incumbent does not apply and um, continue with their um, election this year. So if anybody has any questions or concerns or would like more information about the elections or the um, commission recruitment, please give the city clerk's office a call and we'll be happy to work with you on that. Thank you. Greg? Brown? Nothing. Brian, I got one question. Here about two months ago, you said our security system was about 90% complete. How much are we now? We And why isn't it complete by now? Oh, um, we are, as far as the cameras, uh, our bad readers, bad readers are all reading correctly. Cameras is the next phase, um, and we're waiting uh, for them to hook up all the software that is required for that. We met with the architect actually uh, on Monday for phase two, which includes the front lobby area and, re and redesign of the front lobby. We met with uh, representatives from every department regarding that. That'll be next, our phase two process in which then we will come back with two conceptual designs for you. And then that will be uh, 
uh, reviewed for us to make per recommendation on one of those, and then we would go into construction documents and build it. And uh, when you say the front lobby, that mean those little half doors are going to have some kind of a yeah that whole th badge the, reader on them or yeah, something. Yeah, not only that, uh, council member, but. Uh, W w the the way we allow people in and out of the front areas, how they will, uh, how the counters operate and work now. Uh, each department has a representative on our subcommittee to actually talk about functionality and how that will work. Uh, one of the points of discussions with the architect was also ballistics, uh, structural requirements. So we're looking at all of those. Uh, we we want to be friendly. Uh, to the public, but yet we want to also be able to provide that that barrier or security. So that was very well. Uh, dis the the staff that were engaged in that uh, had a great thorough discussion. Uh, Dana's on that subcommittee too, and so we're taking a look at all that as well as the lobby. So it really reflects to our lobbies, and that includes also the uh, parks and recreation lobby as well as part okay, of the discussion. Good. All right. Thank you. Well, with that, nobody has anything else. Uh, we're adjourned. Kevin, you, you, you